We are gearing up for the finale of This Is Us, now just a few weeks away. So we're catching up with one of our favorites this week, Mandy Moore. Plus, one of the young stars on the drama spoke to us about some advice that he was given from co-star Sterling K. Brown. That's all on the way. And later, a throwback Thursday with Lena Dunham from her girls' days. But first, let's check out today's Pop Start headlines. First up, we mentioned this a little bit earlier last night. So much fun for us. We're all a little tired today, but for a good cause. It was the Today family getting together to celebrate our show's 70th anniversary at a special Paley Center event right here in New York City. The great Harry Smith did such a great job moderating for the night as we took a look back at today's historic run so far and reflecting on the many groundbreaking triumphs of our show. We have to single out Hoda sharing the moment when she realized the impact of being, you're right in front of me here, the, the time when you remember when the impact you your first named uh, first female co-anchor along with Savannah on today. I remember I went to a soul cycle class the next day and I walked in and usually it's someone's birthday and everyone's always applauding and I walked in and people started applauding and mm -hmm. I literally was looking around I was like whose birthday where's the little cake that you know that they all bring out and they said no what you and Savannah did today that changed everything and it wasn't until that moment that it hit me that it that it was something that meant something to other people and uh, like a woman came and up then grab a Kleenex arms. because Savannah follows that up oh by gosh. not leaving a dry eye in the house talking about what it's like to be a part of this team it's wonderful to have a female partnership but to me it's like to have this friend and cheerleader and partner and I really feel that from her and I hope we share that you know it's like it's incredible. I always, I say, I'll hold my hands and close my eyes and go anywhere with you. I would. Oh. You know, Willie and I had a nice moment. We were held up in a stairwell for about 20 minutes before we walked out on that stage and we we're looking at each other going, look at us, you know, it's a, it's a work night. And, and Willie said, and I totally agreed. He's like, you know what, but if I had to be anywhere tonight doing anything, work related or not, these are the exact people I would want to be so with. True. So, so true. So true. Right like it's true. That was yeah. Yeah. fun. Yeah. Yeah. Nope. No. You're right. That was a great was night. Uh, next up, Downton Abbey, a new era. Entertainment Weekly sharing a sneak peek at the upcoming Downton sequel, the latest chapter of the story of the beloved uh, Crowley family. Sorry, I don't watch the show. And Crowley. Uh, Crowley. 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 Thank you. Help me out. <laughs> Heading across uh, Europe to the French Riviera. I cannot wait. <laughs> After the Dowager reveal that she is the owner of a mysterious villa. <laughs> but look out, because now the favorite Mr. Oh, Mr. Carson's Great name. Stuffy. Yeah. They're always so stuffy. <laughs> he struggles to acclimate to the relaxed French lifestyle and the language barrier. It certainly isn't helping him. Bonjour, monsieur. Glare. Uh, no. Um, cover. C uh, cool. Uh, yes. Carson? Oh. Be of help. Um, on va prendre celui-là, s'il vous plaît, Monsieur Roussel. I thought maybe this one. It makes you look like King Zog of Albania. Oh, Carson. Look at so Carson. stuffy. Sure, Carson. <laughs> Carsons are so yes. stuffy. Yes. Uh, we cannot wait to hear all about the cast when they went abroad to film that. And we're going to ask them all about it because they're going to be swinging by Studio mm, 1A yay. next week to give us the inside scoop. Mm -hmm. All right, next up, Avatar, The Way of the Water. It's been 13 long years since audiences first dove into James Cameron's World of Pandora. And now a teaser trailer for the sequel is finally here. It dropped earlier this week. And guys, people are pumped for this. Let's just get to the metrics of trailers. In the first 24 hours, the the trailer was viewed almost 150 million wow. times. Yep. There's numbers for this. That trumps the debut streaming for teasers oh from other mega franchises like Marvel's Black Widow and Star Wars Rise of Skywalker. So a lot of action on this one. After building up more than a decade of anticipation, The Way of the Water has got a lot to live up to. We'll find out if it does when it premieres in theaters this December. Mm -hmm. you excited for that, Al? Oh, yeah. I, I watched the trailer three times. Yeah. Oh, you did? I did. It's, I mean, it's <laughs> stunning. Wow. And I never finally, saw Avatar. Uh, speaking of, of stunning or perhaps not so stunning, Blake Shelton. Hey. Our friend is jumping on the latest oh TikTok boy. dance mm. craze, and we're not sure why. <laughs> uh -oh. Take a look at Blake's dance moves to Lizzo's About Damn Time. It's about damn time. In a minute, I'm going to need a woman to pump me up. What is he so doing? Likeable. What's happening though? But it that's not. Like he works at a local airport. And he's guiding Cessnas. <laughs> I know. <laughs> what is this supposed to look like? Park this Can way. Come this way. What's it's this? not sexy. I'll say that. That's no. a good thing. No. What's this okay, here we oh, go. Is this it? Okay. Okay. Let me okay. see. Oh well, that's much better. That bears no resemblance. <laughs> All right. It's Pop Star Plus. A few more headlines now. First up, this was great. DJ Khaled. 
another one. The music superstar is going viral after lending a hand or two at a recent Miami Heat basketball game. The video starts off with Khaled returning an out-of-bound ball to the Heat's Max Strews, but then here's the part that's lighting up the internet. He walks to the sidelines, gets all the fans pumped up here before giving coach Eric Spolstra a quick impromptu massage, as you see there. At the post-game press conference, Spolstra said he didn't even notice DJ Khaled at first, but said uh, that the shoulder rub was awesome calling DJ Khaled a great fan. Pretty funny. All right, and finally, Jimmy Buffett. Last night, the laid-back hitmaker stopped by The Tonight Show during Fallon's audience suggestion box segment with a Margaritaville performance like you've never heard before. Check out Buffett, Fallon, and the great Florence Welch of Florence and the Machine jamming out to this beachside classic. Some people claim an unlikely trio of making some great music though super fun look at jimmy buffett he's the best and there you have it the that's all you need to know for now but the show continues with our friend mandy moore who's going to update us on her life she's a mom and of course the finale of this is us plus she's got some new music coming up can this still end diplomatically with Vladimir Putin in charge of Russia? Our promise to take in 100,000 Ukrainian refugees. Is that enough? The circus-like stuff that the hearings turned into. This system seems broken. What do we do? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia. Could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. This is a critical choke point for this fire. And good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. And welcome back to Popstar Plus. If you love This Is Us, and who doesn't really, you know this series has almost reached the end. And ahead of the final episodes, we had a chance to talk to one of the stars, our friend Mandy Moore. She told us about what it's been like to wrap up the show and so much more. After six heartwarming and tear-jerking seasons, the beloved show, This Is Us, is coming to an end. Yeah. Oh, can we get some <laughs> tissues? Pass them over. You need them. All right. This all-star cast, as you know, includes Mandy Moore, who played the matriarch, Rebecca Pearson. But don't worry. All you Mandy fans, you're going to be hearing and seeing a lot of Mandy soon. Yeah, she's out with a brand new album. It's just beautiful. It's called In oh. Real Life. And she's headed out on tour, so I feel like there's going to be a lot of people coming. Right. <laughs> just to they be in your closure. They want closure. They want more of I Mandy. I will give them some musical <laughs> catharsis. I was going to yes. say. We have so many cool things to talk about, but Jen and I are just ooing and going over your little baby. Aww. I mean, how old is he? 14 months. 14 months. Yeah. What is motherhood at this stage <laughs> like for you? I oh. mean, he's walking and talking. You guys remember oh. it well. He's just, he's so, he's such a happy, sweet guy. He's like a mini version of my husband in every <laughs> he way. He really is. He, he looks, looks like, like him, like but him. he has the same personality. He's the best. Okay. okay. I tell it's so moving just even seeing pictures of that yeah. little guy. He's just, uh, wow. so much fun. And, and how is being a mom, I mean, you play mm -hmm. this very famous yes. yeah. matriarch who, like, This Is Us is going to be one of those classics, <laughs> yeah. and you are the lead role, mm -hmm. So how, but how did becoming a mom yourself change everything it's for you? It's changed everything on a cellular level. I feel like I want to go back to the beginning of the series <laughs> now and, like, completely redo it. Well, because I'm like, I have some just inkling of what it 
means to be a parent now, and I had I was faking it, you know. Before uh -huh. it's, it's yeah, it's so strange. Well, the best. you you play that role so beautifully. Mm, um, thanks. We know it. Sterling K. Brown knows it. Mm. Sterling K. Brown is on a mission for you. Okay. A one man can A one man can't. Well, he's actually there's probably a lot no, of people who get on board. It's spread. But let's just take a look oh, at him. He God. wants you to get that Emmy. Take a look. <laughs> I don't want anybody who votes in the academy, okay? Anybody who's got a say in what happens, the tastemakers, et cetera, et cetera. Mandy Moore is killing the game, son. Y'all know Mandy Moore is eight years younger than me. And she played my mama. The beautifully subtle, nuanced work and the portrayal of someone going through what her character is going through. It's just exquisite, man. Oh, I love my friend. You know what? We are we are such a family unit, and we have been from the very beginning. God, I love him. <laughs> I'm gonna cry just thinking like I I miss my friends, my family already. But I think we are all each other's biggest champions. Like the fact that we've done six seasons, 106 episodes I mean, together, and I think we all collectively feel like. Wow, the quality of the work never wavered, and we're just proud of each other. We support each other. It's, it's he's the best. I mean, I was gonna say, I think that that should be an example of what true friendship looks yeah. like. Yeah. Oh my that, gosh. But also, can we just add to that that we also think anybody voting for the no, yes, of course we you agree one hundred. Should take it. <laughs> I, I remember after you, you had one scene, and I don't remember exactly what it was, but he started a round of applause for you oh, yeah. because oh. it was so moving to him in that moment. So all that. That love I was just thinking about saying goodbye mm. like knowing that this is the final season knowing that when you said goodbye yeah it, you weren't coming back after summer break kind of thing. yeah I don't think we were just talking about it I fully processed it yet like I get emotional thinking about it it was probably more emotional being on set for a lot of the uh, my other friends last day like I was there for Susan and for Chris Sullivan Sterling and Chrissy and Justin shot after um, the next day but Milo and I wrapped together and Chrissy Susan and and Sterling all stayed around like stayed you know a couple hours after they were done with work to like watch Milo and I rap mm -hmm. like that's how we feel about one another it's it's yeah it's it's very how you, emotional how do you feel that that space that's a big space to fill yeah, I don't know how I'm gonna fill it, but I'm curious to f to figure that out. I don't have anything planned right now. Yeah, um, I'm, gonna, for this, for I'm gonna go on tour. tour. I'm gonna go on tour, but that feels like that's a fun, cathartic experience, and I'll be able to hopefully process everything that I've just lived for the last six years, but work-wise mm. on that other side of my life, I don't really have anything planned. Mm. I'm excited to be mom for mm -hmm. a little bit. Yes. Yeah. You know, and I think not rushing is so yeah. smart. We showed, um, there's a picture of you, we played Candy as our opening song, <laughs> which I feel like we're similar age. Yeah, yeah. yeah. How old are you? 38. Okay, I'm 40, so <laughs> I listened to this song. Oh my gosh. Like, <laughs> as a teen. Yeah. And to watch your evolution, like your music is different. Yeah. yeah. And how, what does it feel like to like, come into mm -hmm. to this age of you? I mean, to have been doing this for 23 mm. years now, to still have a career to speak of, to me is like, <laughs> that kind of longevity is something I never could have imagined for myself. But yeah, I mean, I started out as a pop star yes. back mm -hmm. in like, you know, the yes. late 90s mm -hmm. where that was the thing. And yeah. I had no creative control. I didn't write my music. So now to jump forward two decades and being in the driver's seat of what I'm saying and how it's sort of presented to the world is everything. I have to say, you know, Mandy and I go back to my MTV days. I knew her when she was, I mean, just 15, coming on the music scene. So uh, it is always great to see her, and I'm so happy for her success. Mandy, love you. All right, we've got a lot more coming up from This Is Us just ahead. One of the younger stars, actor on the show, sharing some advice that he received from his older co-stars. Can this still end diplomatically with Vladimir Putin in charge of Russia? Our promise to take in 100,000 Ukrainian refugees. Is that enough? The circus-like stuff that the hearings turned into. This system seems broken. What do we do? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. News is happening now. Are you ready? 
look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world. Because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free now. We will meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Who is this? For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to Popstar Plus. Niles Fitch has spent six seasons playing teenage Randall Pearson on This Is Us. And now the 20-year-old told us what it's been like to soak in advice from his co-stars and mentors, Sterling K. Brown and Milo Ventimiglia. I've been able to build a family from through This Is Us. It's been a learning experience. I feel like there's been a lot of... Uh, ups and downs, a lot of scary moments, a lot of happy moments. No one person has had the greatest impact on my life. No one person could be my MVP, my most valuable person. Oof, shh, hush, go on. When it comes to being able to contact Milo and Sterling for advice, it, it's been such an amazing time. And I feel like it's kind of prepared me to, in a way, become a man. So I'm sad, but excited to finish this because, you know, everything good must come to an end. A British anthropologist named Robin Dunbar wrote, we meet approximately three new people a day. That's 1,095 people a year. I'm 17, which means I've met 18,615 people so far. So how am I supposed to pick the most impactful one out of 18,000? I was doing a scene and it had to deal with me having a transformative moment and I couldn't be a kid anymore. I had to be in a way sterling. And when, you know, I, I did it him and I had a conversation after and I was like, uh, I was like, dang, six years, you know, and me, Sterling, Lonnie, none of us have ever really talked about what it is that we do that makes us Randall. So for, for the past six years for everybody to be saying about how we play it so similar and you know all that has been such a uh such an interesting thing but i would say sterling instead of giving me acting advice because i feel like any actor can give you acting advice he gives me real life man advice and that's what i need personally uh so it's because that that only that makes me a better person a better actor better everything so that's that's kind of the advice that i'm always trying to hit sterling up about because there is no blueprint in order to be, you know, get to where a Sterling, uh, you know, is. So being able to just have somebody that I can talk to about, you know, things like that is really interesting. Because I, I, I do mainly only work with Kevin or Logan, Hannah, Mandy, and Milo. It is sometimes hard to run to the other cast, but John is the funniest man on set. Chrissy is the nicest lady ever. Literally every time I see her, she puts a smile on my face because of how kind she is. So there is every every cast member I probably have a funny, interesting story with. I for sure have my favorite episode, and I'm super biased. It's, it's the one that I was featuring in the most. Let's go find the library. OK. Me and Milo got to go to Washington, D.C. to film at Howard because it's an episode about uh, Randall going to visit Howard. It was the most fun I, I'd had. I was maybe 16, 17. 
uh, at Howard with friends. It was a it was a very fun time for me. That's nice. Yeah. RP at HU. <laughs> you still rocking that box, man. I told you about that. I like it. I can't wait to show <laughs> you around, man. Six years of doing This Is Us, when it comes to the character, I'd say be yourself. I think I spent a lot of years when I was younger thinking that there was some type of way to be cool, but cool doesn't benefit happiness. Cool is something that other people put on you. Uh, um, but I know after playing Randall for all the years, even though he was sometimes socially awkward and had his quirks and all that, he was happy. You know what I'm saying? That's what I learned about in my six years of playing Randall to be more confident by myself like he is, be a perfectionist. I've been doing this just for six years and one day I'm gonna finish it and I'm gonna wake up and they're gonna be like, what's next? So I think that taught me to never get lost in the moment. That's why I'm at SC right now for filmmaking because I'm trying not to get lost in the moment. I'm always trying to get people prepared for something else so I can you say what's next. Thanks to Niles for chatting with us. And don't forget, just two more weeks until This Is Us finale here on NBC. All right, still to come, we're heading into today's vault for a clip with the cast of Girls. News is happening now. Are you ready? Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. News is happening now. Are you ready? Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. NBC News, streaming free now. Welcome back, Lena Dunham drew inspiration from her own life, of course, when she created and starred in the Emmy-winning series that everybody was watching called Girls. And ahead of Lena's birthday tomorrow, we thought it'd be fun to take you back to 2013 when the show was starting off a successful second season. Take a look. Lena Dunham is the series creator and star, and she's here with her co-stars, Allison Williams, Jemima Kirk, and Zasha Mamet. Good morning, ladies. Good morning. Good morning. So let's catch up. Last season was eventful for all of your characters. We had a, one accidentally smoking crack, a surprise wedding, a freak mm -hmm. relationship ending accident, a groping incident with the boss. What do you do for an encore, Lena? Well, we're keeping it. We're continuing to push the envelope, <laughs> I hope. I think that if you... Loved what we were doing last season. We're going to push it further. And if you hated what we were doing last season, you will hate it even more. Well, let me throw some adjectives at you. Critics have called this smart, funny, groundbreaking, brilliant, brilliantly raw, true breakthrough. Does that make it a little intimidating when you sit down and start trying to write a second season? You know, I think it's really easy to get sort of caught in that sort of sophomore syndrome and have this incredible amount of anxiety about following something up that's received some kind of praise. But I just, I feel so inspired by the people that I work with and so kind of keen to kind of keep my creative bubble going that you really have to separate sort of the reaction from your own creative process, not to sound like a, like a hippie. Of course, it's important to respond to your viewers, but <laughs> it's also important to really stay connected to the reason you started doing it in the first place. And I watch this show. I, I don't feel that I am that old, but I have to say I find myself mortified a lot. Is that the point? <laughs> Is it supposed to be shocking? Jemima, what do you think? Um, I would I would think so, yeah. I think it is supposed to be a bit shocking at how realistic it is, yes. Do you think it's realistic, Allison? Yeah, and I think also part of it is like 
holding up a very harsh kind of fun housey mirror to people and that's very uncomfortable at times. I don't think people are used to looking at themselves that closely. I don't really. think the intention is to shock me. I don't think Lena's writing it being like, oh, this is going to be a shocker. Yeah. You know, I just, I just think that is a side mm. effect. Yeah. It sounds well, so cool when you say shocker. 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 That's a shocker. <laughs> you should write that for her character but since it sounds so good. You know, there are people who love this series and then there seems to be a category of people that love to loathe it. Um, I haven't heard. I haven't heard about anyone who doesn't like it. Yeah. Well, that's good. Okay. So here, oh, all right. But I'm so gullible. I was like, all right. Well, that's great. Sorry. I guess you don't get online. <laughs> but I mean, some people think, oh, these characters—they're so entitled. These like twenty-somethings. They're so self-absorbed. What do you say about that? Well, you know, I don't know. I'd be curious to know what it was like for you guys to play them. For me, I think that I sort of object to the notion that characters have to be likable. I feel like. I don't like most of my friends. I love them, and that's the same way that I feel about the characters that I write. And I think it's really important to have characters on television who are sort of ambiguous and complex the way that people are, especially female characters, because so often women are sort of relegated to sassy best friend or ingenue or evil job-stealing biatch, and it's really nice <laughs> to work somewhere in the middle. Yeah. I don't know. Do you ever have trouble sympathizing with your own? No. I, wouldn't, I mean, I wouldn't say so. I, mean, I think that's the... That's what humans are like. You know, humans on any given day are wonderful or totally unlikable. And I think that's like the brilliance of our Miss Dunham here is that like we all play against type constantly. And it's a terribly selfish period of life. Yeah. You know, like your early 20s, you were literally trying to figure out like yourself yeah. and what you were doing with your life. So I think that that's. It's normal that they would be slightly self-involved. I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention, by the way, Allison, that we are we are on the Today Show set right now, but we were also at the world headquarters of the Allison Williams fan club because your dad, <laughs> Brian, of course, Aww, is, is the president. Yes, the he most certainly is. And with he many, will tell you that, many yeah. enthusiastic members around Aww, here. He comes to you. set more often than some of our crew members. He's yes. Very, is it a little, a little bit stalkery at all? or? Well, it's definitely, like, there's definitely disorienting moments where it's like, PAs start to cry because Brian Williams is at Video Village. <laughs> and no, I mean, it's, he's just really proud. He's proud of all of us. I also think he feels paternal about all of us. I think he'll probably, like, you know, he feels a lot of love for this whole show, and obviously he's really excited that this has happened. So, And That's I so imagine nice. all of you have had to kind of conquer your any fears, because there's these are fearless portrayals. Is that, it, it, has it been hard to do for any of you? You guys have been all so brave and so game. Well, you're really brave. You're really maybe the bravest person mm, I know. Yeah, that's so nice. I always think it's like brave to like step into the mouth of a lion or do something that you're actually yes. to save a baby, but it's not that brave to get naked if you're not stressed about being naked. <laughs> and by the way, that's a good teaser. There'll be a lot of that in season two that we know. Boy, it's fun to revisit moments like that. That was such a great show. Thanks for being here, by the way, on Popstar Plus. It's time to go. We'll do it again tomorrow. See you then. So long. Bye-bye. You can go now. You're still here? Go. Welcome to Today All Day. All Day? Today All Day. All Day. This is a long oh, way of man. asking yeah. who's your okay. favorite character you've ever oh, played? The right. unicorn. The unicorn. You gotta have the unicorn. <laughs> what is she right there? That's why you're saying all these nice things? Yeah, she gave me the, the look. Sorry to disturb your day. Everyone's mad at you, Willie. Better make this fast. I don't want the wrath of Luna. When I see you, I always think, I wonder what his quote would be. Give us six minutes and we'll ask as many questions as we can. Welcome to Cold Cuts. Cold Cuts. Cold Cuts. Hi, buddy Cal. Cooking with me. Dad's no babysit. It's called parenting. What was the first book you remember loving? Heart Smart Today. With simple exercises to strengthen your heart. Make the most of your beach days. It's all about the tracksuit now. How wow. good do they look? I now pronounce you husband and wife. Kiss the bride. This morning, a story of people helping people. You've received tons of letters from people who have been inspired. Let's do the weather out. <laughs> OK. All you got to do is say, it's cold, it's warm, it's raining, it's snowing. That's it. One of our most favorite yes. franchises ever, wow. Ambush Makeovers. Okay. Look at it. It doesn't, it doesn't look so good. No, it doesn't look good. Will you judge okay. us in a cook-off? I yes. will, and okay. you guys will definitely win something. Today, all day. All day? All day. Welcome to Today, All Day.
Shop All Day contributor Chassie Post, and each week I'm here with the must-have fashion and beauty products at a price you'll like in Style Finder. I'm Shop All Day contributor Makon Dovu, and I'm bringing you industry insiders and those in the know to share all the buzzworthy products sweeping social media in Influenza Trends. I'm Shop Today editorial director Adriana Brock, and I know shopping trends. I seek out new and notable products so you don't have to in editor's pick. This is Shop All Day, Women-Owned Businesses. Hi, I'm Chassie Post, and we're back today with a new episode of Shop All Day. And in honor of Women's History Month, we are celebrating women-owned businesses and the ladies who built them. From cosmetics to jewelry, we even have bathing suits made for all body types. And later, a conversation with Nancy Twine, the woman who founded Buzzy Brand Briogeo Hair Care. And remember, see that QR code on the corner of your screen? You can use the camera on your smartphone to scan it for instant access to the products on the show today. Or you can text SHOP to the number below to shop all the products we're sharing with you today. So let's get to it. First, we have Fortune and Frame, a woman-owned business known for their wonderfully unique jewelry and accessories that are designed to hold fortunes love notes to self, and special messages. So the original concept came about when designer Gretel Going got an insightful fortune from a fortune cookie and wanted to hold on to it. And she shoved it behind a refrigerator magnet and forgot about it. So when the fortune kept falling onto the kitchen floor, an idea was born. And Gretel didn't have a background in jewelry, but she took a leap and spent the next two years knocking on doors in Manhattan's jewelry district, hoping that someone would show her the ropes. And right when she was about to give up, she met her mentor, the wife of a jeweler, who took her under her wing and taught her everything she knew about making models, molds, and casting the pieces. And these designs became the brand's now iconic fortune lockets and frames. So here we have some of her best-selling pieces. So starting with the Secret Diary Book Locket. And look how beautiful these are. Also, we have the Fortune Locket and, of course, the Fortune Cookie Locket. And what is so amazing about these lockets is they open up to reveal these little beautiful special messages. And the cool thing is you can choose from over 600 different messages on the Fortune and Frame site, or, and I love this, you can actually personalize your own message. I also think these make really, really special gifts and they come in these gorgeous little boxes. Next, let's talk beauty. Bossy Cosmetics was founded by a Boston-born and Nigeria-raised Aisha Dozier, a self-described lipstick junkie who says she never imagined starting a global beauty brand when she started her career as an investment banker over 20 years ago. After leaving her finance career, Aisha was diagnosed with severe hypertension and took a sabbatical at Stanford University and it was there that she realized that what really brought her happiness was mentoring women. So she committed to building a business that combined her passion for beauty and mentorship. And gosh, she's done just that. Bossy Cosmetics was created as a beauty brand that cares more about how women feel than anything else, with the intention to empower women to look, feel, and do good. And it all started with lipstick. Yes, Aisha says she defines lipstick as her love language. And she also calls lipstick a superpower that boosted her confidence throughout her career in a male-dominated profession. So today, we've got some of Bossy's best-selling products, starting with, you guessed it, a lipstick. So here we have the Power Woman Essentials Bullet Lipstick, and this is the number one bestseller for them. And the brand says they're infused with watermelon seed oil, and they give a really velvety, ultra matte finish. Plus, they're also vegan and cruelty free. Now, we also have another bestseller of theirs, the Power Woman Essentials Liquid Lipstick, and the brand says that these formulations are infused with vitamin E. And lastly, Bossy Cosmetics is not just about lipstick. Here we have one of their best-selling eyeshadow palettes, which also happens to be their first eyeshadow palette. And it has nine gorgeous colors. 
Now, if you've ever been intimidated by fake lashes or have always wanted to try them but have been worried that they might be too much for every day, then get ready for some good news. Jenna Lyons, the former creative director and president of J. Crew, and in my opinion, one of the most influential style arbiters of the past two decades, has reinvented the fake lash. Yes, Jenna is making waves once again with her launch of Love Scene, a collection of accessible fake lashes designed for women who are looking for something more natural-ish. That's her word, and I love it. Jenna saw a hole in the market for less dramatic fake lashes, and she says that she wanted to create lashes that would amplify one's own beauty and help people look like themselves only brighter. So she teamed up with makeup artist Troy Olivier and they went to work in true meticulous fashion. Love Scene offers eight different styles of cruelty-free and affordable lashes in different colors. And you can also choose from different lengths and fullnesses and looks that take you from no makeup to a full bead of makeup. And the brand even says, that each pair has been designed to work on every eye shape and skin tone and can be worn up to 10 times. So here we have Love Scene's starter kit. It comes with two sets of lashes, some of their favorite tried and true glue, and it also comes with this case, which I think is so chic. And because you can use the lashes up to 10 times, you can store them right in here. And here's an eyelash tool that they invented that helps you put on your eyelashes more easily. And lastly, meet Asutra, a women-founded and women-led company dedicated to creating products that help to promote active self-care. And I really love their motto, self-care isn't selfish. Asutra is owned by Stephanie Morimoto, who is the CEO, and Venus Williams. Yup, that Venus Williams, who is part owner and their chief brand officer. And the brand also says that they are passionate about the natural ingredients that they use in their products, like organic plants and minerals and essential oils. And they also say that their products are paraben and petroleum free. So we've got some of their most popular products here with us, starting with one of my absolute favorites that I have personally used. This is their Soak the Day Away Ultimate Relaxation Dead Sea Bath Salts. They've got a lavender and rosemary fragrance. They also have one with eucalyptus. And I've gotta tell you, when you use these, you just take a scoop, you put it in the bath, and it really does feel like a spa day right at home. Next, we have another product that really put the brand on the map, and these are the natural yoga mat cleaners, and you can choose from seven different essential oil blends, and these also smell just so fabulous. And lastly, we have two of their newer products. First, the Melt Body Butter. It is so luxurious, and the brand says that it has lavender and magnesium, and also we have another new product, and this is the lavender body oil, and oils are such a big trend right now. So let's go through these products one more time, and you can use the QR code to get instant access to these items. We've got the Fortune and Frame Jewelry, the Bossy Cosmetics Lipsticks and Palette, the Love Scene False Eyelashes, and the Asutra products. So that's it for Style Finder. Up next, Mako and Lovu has an inspiring conversation with the founder of Briogeo Hair Care, whose deep conditioning mask is sweeping social media. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking down. Yeah. You got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? Sounds so good! I love it! We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world. 
because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. You've got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? Sounds so good. I love it. NBC News, streaming free now. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. You've got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? Sounds so good. I love it. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Who is this? cover the news, you have to be in it. These are families trying to board those trains to Poland. I also want to get home. You'll get home. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Hi there. Welcome back. I'm Makon Jovu, and this is Influencer Trends, where I'll be talking to industry insiders and they'll share their favorite products and must-have items to shop for right now. And don't forget that QR code on the corner of your screen. Use the camera on your smartphone and scan it to shop these products. Or you can text SHOP to the number below to shop all the products we're sharing with you today. Nancy Twine traded in her Wall Street career and created Briogeo hair care using her mother's beauty recipes. I love that. Hi, Nancy. So glad that you are here. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm actually in Utah right now for a ski weekend. Oh, nice. You have this amazing hair care brand called Briogeo. What inspired you to start it? Yeah, it's so funny. People ask me that because I'm not a hairstylist and I'm not a chemist. And actually, the inspiration comes from my mom, who was a physician and a chemist. And growing up, my mom used to make so many of our beauty and personal care products from scratch in the kitchen of our home. And I was essentially her sous chef. So at a very young age, I learned about the possibilities of taking clean, natural ingredients and transforming them into highly effective beauty products. Oh, that's beautiful. How do you see your mom's influence from that time in the kitchen sort of transfer to the products? Or is there any influence right now? There's so much influence. So the formulas that we create at Briogeo are a lot more complex. They're utilizing um, a lot more just advanced natural chemistry and ingredients that just weren't accessible to me and my mom when uh, we were doing this back in the day. But so many of the ingredients that have inspired the formulas are the same ingredients that we use at home in our formulas. So there's definitely a lot of inspiration from those childhood memories. Oh, I love that. I know mom has got to be so proud. I'm looking at your hair and it's so beautiful. So the person who uses Briagio, what is their hair story? So one of the things that makes Briagio Yoshio is so unique is that our hair care products are for all different hair textures and types. And one of the things that I really sought out to do when creating Briogeo was to really unite people through one hair care brand. And also, instead of using harsh chemicals or additives, we use clean, naturally powered ingredients that really bring out the healthiness and the shine and the, the beauty in your hair naturally. I love that all hair textures can use this product and it's all about the luster and the shine. I have to tell you, the name of the product line is so interesting to me. What was the inspiration behind Briogeo? Yes, so Briogeo was a unique word to our brand. It's not used anywhere else in the world, to my knowledge. <laughs> And the word briogeo is broken up into two different parts. So the word brio is actually an Italian word that means vibrant, colorful, full of life. And that really represents 
the passion and the, the essence of our brand that we really hope to inspire in every person. It's really all about celebrating what makes you unique. Mm -hmm. And the word geo is a Latin word that means of earth or of nature. And that speaks to our clean ingredient methodology. So oh. Rio Geo really encompasses who we are from the inside out. Oh, that's beautiful. I love that explanation. You know what else I love? Following the brand on social media. They have a cult following. What's the number one product that you get the most feedback on? What do you think people love the most? So the number one product is this product here. I have it with me. Um, it's the Don't Despair Repair Deep Conditioning Mask. This is a holy grail. Like I said, I'm out here in Utah. It's really cold. And oftentimes the winter months can bring about a lot of dryness to the hair. And dryness is one of the biggest culprits to damage. And so this product is clinically proven to reduce breakage. It brings back the natural shine, luster of your hair. And not only does it help to repair breakage, it also helps to prevent future damage. And it's a really, really fantastic product. And I see you opening it up right yeah. now. And I'm so glad that you did because it has this incredible like texture mm. um, that almost looks like pudding. It's kind of like this pudding treatment for your hair. It has really concentrated natural oils, vitamins, and antioxidants that really restore the vitality of the hair. And this is our number one best-selling product. And it has been since we launched the brand back in 2013. I can see why. It feels so creamy. It feels like it's gonna nourish my hair. And so how do you use it? Do you put like a shower cap on top of it? Do you put it when your hair is wet? How does it work? That's a great question. This is actually a weekly treatment and you use this in place of your conditioner when you use it. So after shampooing, you rinse out the shampoo, you wring the hair of excess water, and then you apply one to two walnut size amounts from root to tip or where you're experiencing the most damage. You leave it in for at least 10 minutes and then you rinse it out. But you brought up a really good idea because those that have very severe damage may want an even more intense um, mask experience. So you can actually apply it out of the shower, put a plastic cap over the hair to really lock in mm -hmm. that moisture and seal in the nutrients, and then you can wash it out an hour later. But you certainly can do that. Let me tell you something, my hair is heat damaged, so I'm always in search of products that will restore my hair to its original form. Okay, let's move on to the other product that you brought for us. This is also another favorite of yours. Tell me about it. Yeah, so this actually comes from another brand. It's a black owned brand, skincare line um, at Sephora. It's called Shawnee Darden. I had the pleasure of meeting Shawnee Darden. She's an esthetician and has been creating incredible products. And this here is the Retinol Reform Cream. And I've got to tell you, I've used retinols before and they tend to dry out my skin. What's so unique about this product is that it's so hydrating. So you get the benefits of retinol, which is really great for fine lines, wrinkles, um, any sort of blemishes over time. It really helps to fade them, but it also locks in the moisture. So I don't wake up the next morning with dry, flaky skin. My skin is actually hydrated. And this is like one of the only formulas of retinol that I found like this. Oh my God. Gosh, I mean, you see the difference in my hands, where I put the product and where I didn't. I can just imagine that on my face. Okay, thank you for putting me onto this. I love it. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about your journey. I'm so intrigued by it because you started in finance and then you transitioned to being sort of your own boss. What was that transition like for you? Yeah, you know, it was, um, it was a bit daunting, especially because I didn't have a start in beauty. I had never even worked in marketing. So, you know, so much of what I had to learn just came from my experience as a beauty consumer and trying to figure out what would I want? You know, if I was the Briochio client, how would I want to be marketed to? Um, you know, obviously there's such a diverse spectrum of hair textures out there. And as I mentioned before, Briogeo is for everyone. It's not just for me, it really is for everyone. So one of the things that I had to do very early on was to create a very diverse focus group to test the products, to make sure that all hair textures and types really got great results with the formulas. But there was certainly a lot of trial and error um, during the early years. And as I've expanded the business, I've brought on um, employees and a really top-notch management team that does have that industry experience to help me to continue to scale and grow the company. You can't just do it alone, right? It's good to have a team of people that can help you sort of pursue that dream. And one of the things that you're really passionate about is giving advice to entrepreneurs. You tell them to keep pushing through. How do you do that in your business journey? Yeah, it's such a great question. And so much of my ability to be able to do that has really just been focused on my 
own personal wellness practice, being able to make calm decisions, not out of haste, being able to kind of step back and process things. And then also realize that when you get bumped up against challenges, it doesn't mean that you should stop. It means that you just have to find a new way of doing things. So to me, my wellness practices of meditation and yoga have allowed me to kind of create a mindset that really has been able to fuel so much of my entrepreneurial journey. Balance is everything, Nancy, right? Sort of having those tools to help you be equipped with dealing with the challenges. Speaking of the challenges, what's the biggest no that you've received in your career and how did you bounce back from that? I remember early on, there was a big retail chain that I was exploring and I remember I didn't get the opportunity to retail because they felt like I didn't have enough brand awareness at the time. And I'm actually so glad that opportunity didn't work out for us because in retrospect, I realized that they actually weren't the right fit for the brand in terms of what they would really be able to bring to the table to support us. So in that moment, when I got that no from the retailer, it felt like doomsday. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I kept pressing on and looking back, it was actually a bit of a blessing in disguise. Oh, you know, when you get that no, when you're on the other side of it, you can understand why it needed to happen that way. But when you get that initial no, it is so crushing. So let's go back to being with your mom. What would you tell that little girl? I think that, you know, being open-minded about your career, but also leading with passion. Passion allows you to unlock so many opportunities and gifts and strengths within you that perhaps you didn't know even existed. So whether you go down the entrepreneurial journey or maybe you're working for a company, both are great opportunities, but just try to find something that you can root yourself in passion because that's where you're gonna find the most happiness and the most success. That's really good advice. I love your passion. Thank you for sharing it with us. Nancy, it was a pleasure chatting with you today. Enjoy your time in Utah, okay? Thank you so much. <laughs> you too, take care. All right, now let's run through the products one more time. The Briogeo Deep Conditioning Mask and the Shawnee Darden Retinol Reform. Up next, Adriana Brock continues celebrating Women's History Month with her editor's picks. She has more on the inspiring women who founded bathing suits and undergarments for all body types. Don't go away. Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. I appreciate it. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking good. Yeah. You got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? Sounds so good. I love it. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. You've got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? Sounds so good. I love it. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. You've got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? You know what? Our hearts are ready for something like this. <laughs> it's a great workout. It's yeah. everything That's you need. What goes back together? Oh, I'm so, so happy. happy. That's what it takes to set a record. So glad to see you. Let's go. This is a critical choke point for this fire. And good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. I appreciate it. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. 
Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Hi, welcome back to the show. We've been celebrating the women behind iconic brands we love and use. I have my own editor's picks that include everything from fashion to beauty, all founded with a purpose by women. And see that QR code on the corner of your screen? You can use the camera on your smartphone to scan it for instant access to the products on the show today. Or you can text SHOP to the number below to shop all the products we're sharing with you today. Let's get started. Lori Coulter and Reshma Chatteram Chamberlain only founded Somersault in 2017, but it has already made some serious waves in the world of swimwear. The brand used over 1.5 million measurements from a group of 10,000 women to create what we've dubbed universally flattering for all women. It's the swimsuit called the side stroke. And according to the brand, it's made with a fabric that provides compression support and coverage, which is just what we all need in a swimsuit to make us feel confident. Somersault also makes clothing items from swim cover-ups to dresses and loungewear. We've got the French Terry shirt and shorts, which are made for life away from the beach and pool. Reviewers love how versatile the pieces are. You can mix and match them. And from bathing suits to undergarments, Parade founder Cami Telez didn't feel as though the underwear models she saw in the mall growing up were truly representative of what real confidence and self-expression felt like. So she created her own brand to change the narrative. When the brand launched underwear was its main draw. Now Parade has become a buzzy destination for everything from briefs to boy shorts, bralettes, loungewear, and bodysuits. All of the brand's fabrics are made with recycled materials. And two of the brand's best sellers are the Triangle Bralette and the Briefs, which according to the brand is made with the Replay fabric, which is a blend of recycled nylon and spandex. Now, this next product was created out of problem solving. Melissa Mash, Deepa Gandhi, and Jesse Dover launched Dagny Dover in 2013. The goal was to create problem solving bags for every kind of lifestyle. Today, the brand makes everything from weekender bags to pouches. We have the Dakota backpack, which is the perfect solution for everybody from busy parents to commuters and travelers. It is the perfect size to fit all of the essentials that you need, and it's made with a stretchable neoprene fabric so you can really pack it full. Most of Dagny Dover's bags are water resistant according to the brand, and they're designed to stand up to whatever the day brings, with features like a laptop sleeve and a shoe bag. And in the beauty department, we talked to Nancy Twine of Briogeo earlier. The brand makes award-winning products that are free from sulfates, silicones, parabens, and other harmful chemicals that can damage hair and are made with naturally derived ingredients, according to the brand. The deep conditioning mask is made with hair-loving ingredients like rosehip oil and algae extract to repair damage and deliver on shine. And another one that our editors love from this brand is this Scalp Revival Drops. It is a treatment made to target dandruff, and it's formulated with tea tree oil and biotin. After one use, 91% of users in a study felt that their scalp was less itchy, according to the brand. Next up, Coco Kind founder Priscilla Sai couldn't find any products that helped treat her hormonal acne, so she created her own. She quit her job in Wall Street to launch Coco Kind in 2015. The brand launched with just five products hitting the shelves of Whole Foods, but the My Matcha Stick came later on and it has become one of the favorites. Our editors on the team love this little stick. It can be used to treat dry skin anywhere on your body, including under your eyes, on your hands, on your lips. It is made with just three ingredients, which is also really great. Coconut oil, beeswax, and organic matcha tea. And it smells so good. And lastly, this Brazilian beauty blogger Camila Coelho started her career by uploading makeup tutorials to YouTube in 2010. Today, she has her own fashion line, beauty line, and over 1 million YouTube subscribers. Ella Luz is her beauty line, officially launched in August of 2020 and has become a favorite of beauty lovers everywhere. The brand's beauty oil is a no-brainer for nourishing your skin year-round, according to the founder, who says she can be really picky about skincare products, which is why she launched it. It's super hydrating and lightweight and also packed with Brazilian superfood ingredients. The Shop Today team also really loves the oil-infused lip gloss from the brand. It comes in five different shades, from neutral tones to a bold, bright red that you're gonna wanna keep in your makeup bag all season long. And let's run through the products one more time. The items from Somersault, 
the Parade undergarments, the Dagny Dover backpack, Briogeo deep conditioning mask and scalp treatment, Coco Kine moisture stick, and the Ella Luz beauty oil and lip stain. And just so you know, Today works with affiliate partners and earns a commission on purchases made through our links at today.com. Tune in next week for another episode of Shop All Day. When you think Texas, you think beef, brisket, and barbecue. But here in Austin, the state's capital, there's so much more than that. We've got folks and chefs from all around the world who are putting their mark on this city's culinary scene. And in fact, the spices and traditions that pay homage to their families are making Austin a hot food scene. It's really kind of this melting pot of different people, their culture, and their food. The creativity and, and the flavor that they put into the food is really artistry, right? It's really the diversity of food. Like, you can get some of everything here. So what keeps Austin weird and tasty? We're about to find out. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. Austin is home to over 1,200 food trucks in food parks just like this one. But we're here for one specific truck. We're here for Tony's Jamaican, serving up fine Caribbean fare to Austin for more than 10 years. Meet food truck owner Tony Scott and his wife Kim. From humble beginnings in Kingston, Jamaica, Tony has made Austin his home since 2003, and he has always had a passion for flavorful food. When did you start cooking? How young were you? 10. Tony's mother, Hyacinth, taught her sons how to be self-sufficient, especially in the kitchen. So you learned from mom early on? Yes. What was it about cooking that you liked? I don't know, I like food, I don't know. <laughs> Those skills learned during childhood would help Tony define his career. For nearly a decade, he worked a small beachside business, serving jerk chicken and drinks to tourists in Jamaica. But after 9-11, tourism to the island stalled. So Tony moved to the U.S. in search of better opportunities, eventually landing in Austin. With construction booming in the state capital, Tony quickly found a job as a painter, but it was his homemade lunches that reignited an idea. You're working, you're, you bring in Jamaican food that you made, some of your friends taste and say, where'd this I, come from? I, yes, I cook my own food, you know, and they was like, oh, you should, you know, open a restaurant. And it's been 10 years. 10 years now. The 60-year-old chef opened Tony's Jamaican food truck in March of 2012 and his wife, Kim, has been one of his biggest supporters since the very beginning. What was the first meal he cooked for you? Curry chicken and rice, and he invited me over, and once I had it, I didn't want to ask for more. You know how ladies are, we try to eat a little bit, maybe the salad kind of thing, don't want them to know that we that greedy. But it was so good, I asked for seconds. So when Tony says, I want to do a food truck, your reaction? I said, a what? <laughs> I said, a food what? And I knew nothing about food trucks or however, so it was just all his idea. I just followed along. He said he wanted to do something, he had a vision. I said, okay, let's try it. Despite high praise from friends and family for his grub, Tony's business wasn't exactly booming from the start. When you first opened up, was it successful right away? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I came out here 10 o'clock in the morning and I was all here until 3 o'clock the next oh. morning. I make $37. Wow. And you know, I was still happy when I go home and she was like, how much money you make? And I was like, $37. And she break out laughing. <laughs> and I was like, don't worry about it. And next day I come and I 
make $50-something mm -hmm. dollars, and the next day I make $80-something dollars, and I say, okay, I'm seeing an increase. Tony taking advantage of the South by Southwest crowds that flocked to Austin in early March. Shortly after the festival, his fledgling business got a big boost with a small write-up. Kim, what, what to you, what was the game changer? What, what put this place over the top? Wow. His presence and his dedication. Your chicken and hot sauce. Now, loyal customers are visiting this hot spot daily, decked out with the colors and vibes of Jamaica. From curried chicken and goat to jerk everything, food fans walk away feeling the island love. In 2018, Tony laid down more permanent roots in Texas. You opened up a brick and mortar restaurant. Were you nervous about that? A little bit. It was no, a little no, bit. Let me, Kim, were you nervous about Oh, yeah. About I'm that? so glad you asked me that question. Yes, I was. It was something totally different and from a food truck going into a brick and mortar. I didn't come from the restaurant industry. I came from the finance side. Coming in, I was like, I was telling Tony, I said, I got this. You know, I can run this no problem. But oh, no, 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 no. I was ringing the, the red light bell like, hey, I need some help. It was challenging, but also it was fun. Kim now helping run the business for both locations. Family always mean a lot to restaurant. You know, sometimes she, she would say, you never know. One day it might be just me and you. You got to show right. me how to cut this meat. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. You've got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? You know what? Our hearts are ready for something like this. <laughs> it's a great workout. It's yeah. everything Actually, you need. What comes back together? Oh, I'm so, so happy. I That's what it takes to set a record. So glad to see you. cover the news, you have to be in it. These are families trying to board those trains to Poland. I also want to get home. You'll get home. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. You've got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? Sounds so good. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia. Could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Right just chicken and ox there. Thank you Enjoy. very much, sir. Have a great day. You too. God bless. Tony Scott dishes out hundreds of plates to hungry customers each day, but he's best known for one Caribbean specialty. My mother is Jamaican. And in our house, oxtail was king. Yes. yes. Oxtail stew, oxtail and dumpling. Yeah. Oxtail, oh, wow. oxtail, oxtail. My mom is Southern. And she actually mentioned it to me. I said, oxtail. And she just said it was a beef. So I've never really had it. And then when you first had it? It was delicious. And I eat it all the time now that's the problem <laughs> isn't it interesting that it was the cheapest cut of meat now it's considered wow. a delicacy you go to all these oh. upscale restaurants oxtail uh, ravioli oh. oxtail rice all them it's now everybody's into oxtail i know no i'm scared to go in a restaurant and not oxtail <laughs> <laughs> right. the, the price is so high bring on the oxtail stew <laughs> Tony frequently sells out of the succulent oxtail, and it was finally time to see and taste why. Welcome to the truck, Mr. Oh, Hall. Oh, yeah. Oh, it smells good. It smells like Jamaica. Oh, hey, hey. This is the oxtail, oh. the famous oxtail that everybody go crazy over. Mm -hmm. And these are like the Jamaican product seasoning that we use. This have a good flavor to mm. it. Oh, wow. Tony's oxtails are seasoned with a spice mix that includes garlic powder, dried onion, paprika, black pepper, sugar, 
salt, and a few chef secrets. This is my product that I make. It's of like onion, it, it, um, bell pepper, um, scotch bonnet pepper. I also have a little bit of garlic in there. So this is like your own concoction? Yes. And then this is another Jamaican product they call You have a Blue Mountain coffee? Uh, yeah. Well, they say it's the best coffee in the world. Well, right. this is the Blue Mountain product of burnt sugar. Oh, wow. And this is what we pour on it last. Give it that, that good color. Then we just mix this up. Make sure you rub it in properly. You want everything to rub into it. You know, if you take a smell of it, even right now. Oh, yeah. You see, you, you, you can smell that flavor in it and it doesn't even cook. It smells, it smells good. Right. He then lets the oxtails marinate overnight. Then they're added to a pot with water and slow cooked for several hours. This what it comes out to be. Oh, now we're talking. For you to taste. When I came to Austin. The result, truly out of this world. You see how it fall off the bone. Mm. Oh, oh yeah. You know, we we make sure we cook real tender because dental is very expensive. Mm -hmm. And you know you go to some place you have eating that meat and you have to be to get it off the bone. You don't do that when you come mm -hmm. here. Good thing Tony feels like talking. I'm too busy eating. And it doesn't stop with the oxtails. Oh is it Mr. Hall? That's fantastic. This is curry goat right here. Taste that. <laughs> this is the jerk pork. Oh, jerk, but I've never had jerk pork before. Oh. And that's also oh, wow. my homemade jerk sauce that I made. Whoa. Okay, this is the famous curry chicken. And this is the carrot. Oh, so at least I can say I have my vegetables today. Yes. Look at how tender that chicken is. Tony also serves traditional peas and rice, which brought on a wave of nostalgia. This is black bean. When you open that pot, I thought, like, wait a minute. Yeah. This is my mother's peas and rice. This is bread. And just when I thought I'd had enough? Wait a minute, I, I, I noticed. These are beef patty. I gotta try that. Oh, that's a great crust. As a reminder of how far Tony's love for cooking has taken him. If you look up here, you see these little pots? Uh -huh. This pot right here is when I just started out. This is what I usually cook rice into. Wow. The reason why I keep this pot to show people is where Tony's Jamaican food is coming from. Mm -hmm. So what would you tell people who are thinking they've got a dream, they want to start something like you did? What would you tell them? First, you have to motivate yourself to do it. And never give up on your dream. My mama always tell me, don't make nobody tell you you can't do nothing. Tony, thank you so much. It's this a pleasure, Harry. It, it, it is it, nice meeting you. It feels like I'm back in Jamaica. I'm glad you have that feeling. Everything's going to be all right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. You've got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? You know what? Our hearts are ready for something like this. Yeah. It's a great workout. It's yeah. everything Actually, you need. Who comes back together? Oh, I'm you so happy. Me. That's what it takes to set a record. So glad to see you. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. This is a critical choke point for this fire. And good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. I appreciate it. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. News is happening now. Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And 
This is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? Just a few miles from the hustle and bustle of downtown Austin is Mekon Bistro. It is a spot that's loved by locals and tourists alike for its Vietnamese comfort food. Who's the better cook uh, in the family? Um, I'm not going to even bother asking my mom about that because my mom is hands down the best cook. <laughs> Chef Will Hyun and his siblings opened Mekon Bistro to honor their mother, Anne Hang, a refugee who fled Vietnam after the fall of Saigon and working tirelessly to provide for her family in the United States. She took a chance to travel across the ocean with nothing in hand, working ever since she's been over here, working from morning to night uh, and still provide us with a hot meal every day. When Macon first opened, Will hoped that his mom would finally stop working, but Anne had other plans. Technically, she's retired, but like I said, she, she would not stay home. Anne's passion for food starting in her home country. In 1972, Anne married Kia Huynh. They had four children in Vietnam and turning to cooking to help support the family. This is my dad and my mom right, right before the fall of Saigon. When the Vietnam War ended, the family was looking toward a better future in their homeland. But in 1975, the Viet Cong began to invade Saigon. Anne's husband fled the city first, Will leaving when he was just seven years old. It was scary. We left separately, uh, me with my uncle and my mom with my three sisters that came a year later uh, because if you get caught, you were thrown in jail. Luckily, we made it out. We were rescued by uh, cargo boats, but uh, they rescued us. They took us to the Malaysian refugee camp. Will and his uncle secured refugee status, eventually reuniting with Will's dad in the U.S. In the years spent apart from his mother, Will began experimenting in the kitchen with a little nudge from his uncle. He told me that, you know, there's only two of us. You're going to have to do, you know, do your share. So learn to cook something. <laughs> in 1983, Anne made the journey to the U.S. with her daughters. But adjusting to a new country as refugees was a struggle. When we came over, you know, nothing in our pockets. We, we relied on government assistance a little bit. Luckily, she's a great cook. Uh, so it, it wasn't bad for us at all. But growing up, that's how she you know, shows us that she loved us by you know, putting all that love into the food. The family moving from Houston to Louisiana, finding work in the seafood industry. But Will wasn't so happy living in a small town. When his uncle invited him to attend high school in Austin, Will said yes right away. I fell in love with Austin. The beautiful lakes, the miles of trails, the music scene. What's there not to love? <laughs> Austin's vibrant culinary scene struck a chord. After high school, Will found work in several restaurants, dreaming of being able to showcase his mom's cooking. In 2015, the entire family moving to Austin. But Ann still wasn't sure about opening a restaurant. Asked her many, many times in the past to do something like that. She's dead set against it. She said, it's just way too much work. Eventually, Ann agreed to share her recipes for just one reason, her family.
thì lấy về cho cho con được là ngày nào thì hay ngày nấy đi hết cho con mình ngày nào thì hay ngày nấy thôi. She's, she's emotional because like you know, she basically you know, she's doing everything for her kids. The first dish will added to the menu, his mom's pho. So pho, you know, at a restaurant is basically how we do pho at home. Uh, when we cook pho at home, it's a big pot that's gonna feed us for at least three days. Um, we have it full for breakfast, we have full for lunch, we have full for midtime snack, we have full for dinner and full at night for snack at night uh, until the pot's gone. With the help of his family, Will created several new dishes. Our menu does incorporate a lot of uh, fusion Asian dishes um, and that is because of the, you know, the family business. Uh, my, my mom's a cook, I cook. My sister cooks, my brother cooks. Uh, second beef dish was something that I've tried out. I consider myself a Texan. We love beef. It's a dish that my mom and I collaborated together to, to put out. Basically, just tubes of real nice tender beef that's been flashed in a wok. It's been six years since Macon Bistro opened, and Will and his mom still love working together. Làm ăn gia đình thì cái này cũng như giúp cho con thôi Thì thấy nó, nó tự xúc động rồi mình lấy vậy thôi Chứ mà đâu có biết làm sao giờ Mình thấy nó hy sinh cho con mình được thì Ngày nào thì hãy lấy vậy thôi Mình thấy nó xúc động vậy thôi I admire her great The courage it takes just to make that journey And to just stick with us no matter thick and thin She's my hero, she really is my hero News is happening now. Are you ready? Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world. Because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia. Could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. To cover the news, you have to be in it. These are families trying to board those trains to Poland. I also want to get home. You'll get home. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Using food to bring younger generations closer to their heritage happens in families all across America. And it's happening here at Habesha with a husband and wife team who's using their restaurant to bring their daughters closer to their Ethiopian roots. We want more than anything else people to be familiar with not just Ethiopian food, but Ethiopian culture. My name is Ine Fantu. This is my wife, Salama Bebe. We ran an Ethiopian restaurant called Habesha in Austin. When it opened in 2013, Habesha was the second Ethiopian restaurant in Austin. People stay coming in here, we give them the food, they said, where's the fork? Your hands. <laughs> Ethiopian food is eaten with injera, a fermented flatbread made with teff, a gluten-free grain. You'll see a family dining and everyone is on their phone eating and really not enjoying the, the, the event. Not you cannot here. do that in Ethiopian restaurants. You have to use your hands, you can't. Both of them. That emphasis on family is everywhere in Habesha, from the Ethiopian art and decor to Yidni and Salam's daughters, who can often be found studying at the restaurant. I think I was like around four years old when we opened, so like this is like my second home. Salam and Yidni were born and raised in different parts of Ethiopia. In the 90s, they left Africa 
to attend college here in the United States. Yidney immigrating to Texas, Salam to Maryland, where her family owned an Ethiopian restaurant. A chance meeting bringing them together. My dad was visiting a friend dining at uh, her family restaurant, and she happened to be the waitress. And uh, he overheard a music playing and uh, asked her, hey, uh, where could I get the CD? And she was nice enough to, to grab the CD and hand it to him. But Yidney's dad was thinking about more than music. When he got home, he immediately gave his son a call. And he said, hey, just uh, call her and thank her for me. <laughs> <laughs> when he called me, I was like, I give it to your dad, not for you. <laughs> and then he kept calling me. I was like, okay, I think he's not going to give up. My dad was the uh, one who hooked me up. To me, so. <laughs> they dated long distance before Salam moved to Texas, the couple marrying in 2003. Their daughters, Edel and Azel, are now teenagers. I think we've always been around food. My mom's always cooking for me. I love her pancakes. She makes <laughs> the best pancakes. Salam left the restaurant industry to focus on parenting, but Yidney knew his wife's heart was in cooking professionally. What I saw in her was the passion to own her own business. I really want to open restaurant, and I love the customer service and cooking. In 2012, Yidney and Salam finding the perfect location for their restaurant. Austin is a, a, a very unique town in that there is people from all walks of life. And I think part of the reason that we are successful is because of that diversity. Habesh's menu honors their Ethiopian heritage with many vegetarian dishes, from stewed yellow split peas to braised collard greens. They also serve more than a dozen dishes with beef. Texas is, uh, has a lot of people that loves meat, so we have a bigger selection of meat as well. And I think my favorite dish in that is the kutfo, or the steak tartare. When it's uh, done right, that's probably the best dish in the world. It's a ground beef and mixed with butter and spices. When the pandemic hit, Habish's popularity helped save them from closure. And I said, okay, this is it. I, I think we're gonna fall down now. And then people, they support us. They love to be here. They send us check. They send us cards. We have a good, good community. The donations from fans kept them afloat until they figured out a to-go plan. Before COVID, takeout business was only three or 4% of our business. And overnight, we had to do 100% of our business. And by nature, Ethiopian food does not take out, so we have to figure out a way to package the food, to market the food. After laying off most employees, the couple had to work nonstop. As the to-go business began ramping up, Edel and Azel pitched in to support their parents and save their beloved second home. I would write down like the orders, like the online orders, and I would like put them in the kitchen and cleaning, washing the dishes, cutting the injera, like folding it, boxing up to the orders. They did a lot and they're part of the reason why we're still around, so I'm sorry I get a little emotional when I talk about them, but uh, yeah, they're, uh, they're incredible. They're uh, just a uh, love of my life. One of the things that we instill in them is knowing who they are, uh, where their parents came from, and learning the culture, learning the food. Salam is looking forward to a busier future at her dream restaurant. I want to uh, grow this business, and a lot of people, they never had Ethiopian food. They had Chinese food, Italian food, or Indian food. So they don't know about Ethiopian food. I'm really proud of her because like she she gets frustrated at times, but she doesn't let that like stop her. A really big inspiration to me. Whenever things get hard, you just keep going. The best part working with your partner is the fact that you're there for each other, to comfort each other when it's down and uh, to be there when your partner needs you. The best part of it, he knows what I can't do. 
he covered. The same thing, he cannot cook. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, she can handle it. With Austin's welcoming atmosphere, it's no surprise that more chefs are putting down roots in this fast-growing city. It's everything from James Beard award-winning chefs and taqueros and even home cooks. The thing that makes a food scene good is different cultures meeting each other and being able to influence each other. The fact that anything is possible is what makes Austin such a cool place. One thing that rings true here in Austin, no matter your background or culture, there's room for everyone at the table. You know, I love me some country music, and high up on my list of favorites, Thomas Rhett, baby. You know, I've listened to that Die a Happy Man song probably about a gazillion times. Okay, Thomas was born with a passion for music at his very core. He and his dad, country singer Rhett Akins, have worked on music together since Thomas was just a little boy. His love of music has carried him all the way to where he is right now. Thomas, his wife Lauren, and I have been friendly for years, but recently we've connected on more than just music. We're also parents by way of adoption. Thomas and Lauren brought their beautiful daughter, Willa Gray, home nearly seven years ago. And they've gone on to welcome three more daughters to their family, Ada James, Len and Love, and Lily Carolina. Between recording, touring, and parenting, it's kind of tough for Thomas to make space for much else, but I did catch up with him for a rare moment of quiet from his home in Nashville, just as he's getting ready to release his sixth studio album, Where We Started, and among the many topics we touched on, where he started. Stories that make me appreciate Thomas and his music even more. All right. Well, first of all, uh, Thomas, it's great to see you. As always, how are you? Good to see you, too. I'm doing well. I'm doing well. So, Thomas, I, I feel like you're, you're really going 100 miles an hour. And I admire it because we often say, this is my moment. I got to catch it. It's like lightning in a bottle. I don't want to miss it. But if you were to have a day that was just for you, again, Lauren and the kids aside, you have an open book, a, a blank slate for one day. Yeah. How does that day play out for you? Um, <clears throat> I think I would first of all have to get on a plane. Uh, I have a hard time finding peace in Nashville, but I've I've found a lot of peace and solitude out west, whether it's in Montana or Utah or Colorado. And I think a perfect day for me would be to take my fly fishing rod out mm. to the Boulder River in Montana and just wait it the entire day. Just like start oh. at the bottom, go to the top. Uh, don't even care if I catch a fish or not. Just the the simple act of throwing a rod in and out of the river, I think like that that is the epitome of my uh, perfect alone day, which I have not had an alone day, I think, in almost five years. So yeah, at least I, I need I to schedule say. that. So what is it that you get out of being by yourself and throwing that rod? Like what feelings yeah. do you get from that? Uh, there's no one to compare myself to except for myself. Um, mm -hmm. Like... I think as awesome as social media can be, uh, I think I think it ruins a lot of people, uh, and I'm I'm in that box. And I think, I mean, shoot, I guess I've had social media for almost ten years now, and I feel like every time I log on to my Instagram account, I get this like really quick little rush of like, oh my goodness, what did someone say about my song, or what did they say about this? But then I see one negative thing, and like my day is just like ruined. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And so when when I do like get to put my phone down for five or six hours, I find my anxiety level just going Dropping. down and down and down and down. Now, I do have four kids, so the anxiety does stay at a, at a little <laughs> right here. Um, yeah. But I just feel like the more that I can detach from the overload of information, you know what I mean? Like, I, I just don't feel like we as humans were built to absorb, and, and you absorb more knowledge than anybody that I know every day. And, like, I just don't know that we were meant to know as much as we know. I think when I when I am away from anything social or news-wise, yeah. yeah. like, yeah. I am a better dad. I am a better husband. I'm a better friend because there is space to yes. give that part of myself. When were you your happiest? I think I was 
in a strange way, happier at my core when I felt like I wasn't under a microscope, if uh-huh. that makes any sense. Yeah. Um, I know you I know you can relate to that, mm-hmm. but like, would I change anything that I have for the world? No. Um, but there are days where you, you do kind of wish you could just be just you at the core, no matter what, no matter what restaurant you're in, no matter mm-hmm. if you're at Disney World. You know what I'm saying? Like mm-hmm. it's uh, it's that that has changed a lot. I mean, I I have learned how to find joy uh, a ton, mm-hmm. like through through quote unquote being famous or being under the spotlight. But mm-hmm. there just seemed to be something so simple. I don't know mm-hmm. about being in high school or yeah. being in, being in college. Yes. Um, um, and so you know, I think that's that's something that Lauren and I both try to create in our lives is simplicity mm-hmm. and and normalcy. You know, a lot of people always ask how are we raising our kids and. We're trying to raise them as normal as humanly possible, which is really challenging because our lives are anything but normal, you know. Mm-hmm. But I think striving for simplicity has brought Lauren and I and our kids the most joy that, that we mm. could imagine. To cover the news, you have to be in it. These are families trying to board those trains to Poland. I also want to get home. You'll get home. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. News is happening now. Are you ready? Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia. Can you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. From the moment I met you, whenever that was, a long, long time ago when you were just getting started, to right now, you are, I mean, you seem exactly the same to me. I can still (laughs) drunk FaceTime you and you'll pick up, which is my definitely my litmus test. It's my favorite part of my week, I'll be honest with you. (laughs) I don't do it every week, but I do it often enough. No, I I, (laughs) I don't want people to think I'm a stalker. (laughs) (laughs) No, No, me and Lauren love it so much. Um, And and I would say the same about you. I mean, Mm. not that this is like a... Mm-hmm. compliment back yeah. and forth type thing but I, it is very very true like you you are one of the most down-to-earth people that I've ever met especially mm-hmm. with the you're in front of the world every single day um yeah. and so it, when I when I describe my my being under a microscope you are a million times more <laughs> than that but I remember when Lauren and I first got married um we, we I mean I, I think I maybe had 500 bucks mm-hmm. to my name and my dad had just bought a condo and I told him like we can't pay rent and so he just made us pay the HOA fee which was like $45 a month and even that hurt it was our first Christmas as a married couple I just signed a record deal and uh we lived across the street from a um a Harris Teeter which I don't know if y'all have those up there but it was like a grocery store and like I'm talking about five nights a week we would buy a frozen pizza and the cheapest bottle of wine we could find Mm -hmm. and like and we'd go to the Christmas tree lot and I remember Lauren I was like why don't we just go to freaking Target and buy you know, a $9 fake Christmas tree. And she's like, well, because I've always had a real one. And Uh Christmas trees are like 70 bucks. You know what I mean? (laughs) A tree is $70. And I remember calling my business manager at the time being like, hey, can I afford this? And we went back and put that Christmas tree up and made a frozen pizza and had a bottle of wine. And you want to talk about content yet proud that, that we had accomplished that. Well, you and Lauren uh, met when you were little and then ended up getting married after you guys have lived a little. But you were you all were both young and people were telling you, what are you doing? You were like 22 or something. Yeah, we were 22 when we got married for sure. Yeah. Did everyone who tried to talk you out of it? Um, I don't think it was like a a talking out of. It was more of just like make sure. Make sure. You know what I mean? Which is which is normal. You know, I think for a parent to say to a kid like I might say the same thing, you know, if if my daughters were like, hey, I'm 17 and I found the guy I want to marry. I'm like, are you sure? You know, positive. 
But I can also be like, you know what? If that's your heart and that's what you believe, like, here to support you, you know? So you um, were sure and she was sure? We were sure. But we also knew each other for since, like, third grade. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, she knew me as a sixth grader, as a tenth grader, um, as an idiot in college. I mean, she 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 was with me through every every up and down phase of life. And so when we got married, we were already best friends anyway. And they, you know, my parents had always said, make sure you marry your best friend, you know? And mm -hmm. I was like, well, I mean, this is, uh, this is my best friend and she is very attractive and I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm here for it. And, uh, but you know, I think like at that time it, it wasn't super cool to be married and be a, uh, a country singer. You know what I mean? And I yeah, just thought that was the stupidest thing in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it was kind of weird, like at the time, I guess this would have been 2012, I mean, there were love songs, but like there, there weren't, there weren't like a lot of love songs about like from a, from a country singer being like, y'all know who this is and this is what I'm singing about. This is my wife. Yeah, this is you know? for her, right. Um, from the get-go of my career, Lauren was just such a part of, I mean, we were a package deal. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like she came to, she was at every show, the fans knew her, mm -hmm. everybody knew her. And so when Die Happy Man came out, like, yeah, I think the song, I think Die Happy Man is good. But I think that it was great at the time because it hadn't been done in a while in that way. And it was almost like the stars kind of lined up for that song. With all I got is your hand in my hand. Baby, I could die a happy man. Your parents are divorced. Yeah. Were you scared getting married? Did you think our, our patterns, do they repeat? Like, were you worried? Um... Yeah, I mean, there was a part of me that was just like, is is that going to be me too? You know what I'm yeah. saying? Like, yeah. I remember, you know, Lauren's dad, he flies like uh, jets for a living. Like, he owns oh. like a charter company in Nashville. And, you know, in the 90s, he would fly, you know, you, know, you name that country artist, mm -hmm. he flew him around. And so he'd been around the business for a while. And I remember before me and Lauren got married, he was like, you better keep your head on straight. You know what I mean? He was like, you, be you better not do anything out there on the road because I, I promise you I've seen it and I will call you out immediately. And I was like, you don't have anything to worry about, you know? Yeah. And, um, yeah. But as I got into it, I, I, I quickly realized how easy that yeah. could be yeah. um, without the right boundaries mm -hmm. put in place. Did your parents give you um, advice like uh, marriage <clears throat> advice? Uh, yeah, for sure. But, you know, like, you know, I think like my dad and my mom – were, were different. They they kind of came from that generation of like, you know, they got pregnant before they were married uh -huh. um, in South Georgia. Mm -hmm. And it was like one of those times in life where it was like, well, we should probably get married. You yeah. know what I mean? But I think kind of early on, you know, my, I think my dad really wanted, I think he had more life that he wanted to live. And, mm -hmm. and you know, I think him looking back, like those are things that he may not be um, proud of, but like, mm -hmm. That's that's just life. You know, we that's live life. and we, we live and we learn. And, you know, um, I feel like I got really blessed with um with an amazing family that has that has baggage just like we all do. When do you think your dad was proudest of you? Um, I think he may just be proud of how I have approached this career. I think he writes with people all the time that go, "Man, how'd your son turn out so good?" You know what I mean? <laughs> and it's it's kind of a joke, but I but I think he, you know, he kind of gets like, you know, my my dad was was pretty wild, you know, back in the day and uh -huh. and I I've definitely had my fair share of wild moments, but I knew that when I when I got married like this was this was the goal. If everything else fell apart, yeah. this this had to stay together, um, and, yeah. and that that is that is what I vowed the day I got married, and that is what I that is what I plan on, you know, committing to until the the day that I die. Top story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at seven on NBC News Now. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia. Could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Man, who's this? Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. You got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? are ready for something like this. Yeah. It's a great workout. It's yeah. everything That's you need. Who comes back together? Oh, I'm so happy. That's what it takes to set a record. 
so glad to see you. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. News is happening now. Are you ready? Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Well, I know having kids was something that was um, high on your priority list. The way you went about it was obviously very interesting. Yeah. Uh, Lauren was on a mission trip to Uganda yeah. and fell in love, basically. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just, that's just how it happened. So she met Willa. What was it about her, about that specific child of all the children yeah. uh, who Lauren met and, and you got to know? What was it about her? Yeah, you know, that was such a, a crazy time because my wife up to that point had um, – had traveled with me and me solely. You know what I mean? Like she kind of she kind of gave up a lot to to be along my side, mm -hmm. you know, during this journey. I mean, she went to the University of Tennessee, uh graduated with a nursing degree. Uh nursing school about killed her. Um as I'm sure many many nurses out there, it's freaking hard. Um but she finished that and we went into marriage counseling and our marriage counselor said, I think y'all need to be fully together your first year on the road because the year that she graduated, I went on this thing called radio tour, which is where you're gone for like eight months and mm. you're literally visiting every country radio station in the country. So if she had gone and worked in the hospital and I'd gone to do that, our first year of marriage would have been completely just mm -hmm. split apart. And so she decided to come with me that whole first year and that led into the next you know, five years of our marriage. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think my wife ever planned on marrying someone that was doing what I'm doing. Like, I think that if she could have picked at that age, she probably would have picked someone that was going to be home at five o'clock. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. And she probably would have lived a whole lot simpler of a life had she done mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. um, but there was just no denying, uh, you know, our love for each other. And to this day, I mean, I, I just, I literally just look at her and say, thank you. Thank you for marrying me because I, I would be a total disaster. <laughs> I, I wrote a song last year called I'd Be a Nightmare Single, um, and it is very true. Um, anyway, to, back to your question. That was when she had met a few people that were already doing work in Uganda, and I think my wife at that point had felt a little bit um, passionless, if mm -hmm. you will. I, like, I think she felt like her passions had to be my passions. Mm -hmm. um, and so we had a, that was like a year of like long conversation of like, well, what, you know, what, what is your passion? And she was like, well, I still want to help people medically. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like I want to, mm -hmm. I want to use the skill that I trained so hard for. And I was like, well, that's a hundred percent understandable. Mm -hmm. like, let's figure that out, you know, and kind of a, a God thing that she met, uh, this woman named Suzanne who, uh, was already doing ministry and, and, um, mission work in, in Uganda and Lauren went with her and I was still back in America, you know, doing shows and. I remember she sent me a, a picture of this little girl, and uh, in Uganda they had they had named her Blessing. That was the that was the name that they gave her. She didn't have any parents, and uh, and no no siblings um, that that we knew of. And she sent me a picture of her holding Blessing, and she said, "We have got to help, you know, find her family or find find mm -hmm. her a home." And uh, you know they did a ton of research on, you know where where she was found all this kind of stuff and and it was just it was heartbreaking you know like i i can't imagine i don't know one, like one of my children just not not having a family to call mm -hmm. to call home you know and and so i just it just can't i don't even remember saying it but it came out of my mouth i was like we'll we'll we will we'll bring her home you know and mm -hmm. my wife was like are you serious and yeah. next thing you know you know we're what why were you so sure what was it about that image I've just never seen my wife glow the way that she was glowing. Like, yeah, I, I can't, I yeah. can't describe it, but it already felt like it was a thing. I don't remember saying it; it just, it just erupted out of my stomach, just like happened. And, uh, <laughs> and then I, you know, we hung up the phone, and I was like, "What did I just say?" Like, and um, because I don't know that I was ready to be a dad yet. I don't think anyone's ready to be a parent until you are. You know until what I'm saying? You are. Um, that kind of makes me um, like I, I feel like whenever. The truth is told like I get this weird wave of emotion yeah. like I get chills and I feel it 
and you that statement you just made there was like a was like a, a tidal wave for me <laughs> yeah. it was a god moment you said yeah for that's sure. really really big so you got willa gray and and then lauren gets pregnant then y'all are off and running you got four girls now yeah do you want a boy i think i've passed that point to be <laughs> honest with you I think uh, that's like the most question I get asked is like, when are you yeah. trying again? I mean, Lauren's whole dream, she wanted to have five kids. Like that's, five, since yeah. the day we got married, she's like, I want to have five. And I'm sitting there going, <laughs> that's fine. You know, yeah. <laughs> five would be great. But we sit there and we go, you know, they're all in such different phases of life. Mm. <laughs> We're having a hard time figuring out how do we make one-on-one time right. for like all of our kids, for you know? So, got now. so I told Lauren, I was like, I mean, let's have five, but let's, let's take a, let's take a four year deep breath. <laughs> so... Yeah, exactly. She'll get her five eventually, but you're sure. right. sometimes you need a minute. As you know, I adopted two children, and yeah. a lot of questions come up, at which I'm already getting from Haley, and I'm, I will get from Hope, too. What questions is Willa Gray asking, or are your other daughters asking, and how have you guys navigated that? Because I've got two kids from different countries, and, you know, it's, For sure. it, there are questions that pop. Yeah, it's hard, you know, because I, yeah. I, think, I think when you become a parent, you... You're like, well, I'm a dad. I have all the answers, you know, yeah. or I'm a mom. I have yeah. all the answers. Um, and like adoption is, is one of the most beautiful things in the world. And I, and I don't think at the beginning of it, you, I don't think you go, oh, in like six years, I'm going to start answering yeah. some like really, yes, really intense questions, you know? And, and I think, I don't know if you felt this at all, but it's kind of like you go, well, what age, mm -hmm. like what age is the right age? You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Because the world is moving so fast that it's like, mm -hmm. You know, to have a conversation with a six-year-old about that, maybe I'm too old school to think that way, but I go, maybe we need to wait till she's 10. And I, I love the innocence that they have because they don't have any, they haven't been tainted yet yes. by the world. They haven't been jaded by the world. Like they, they don't, they don't see things like adults mm -hmm. see things. And so in, in your parent brain, you're like, well, how do I keep this innocence alive mm -hmm. as long as I possibly as can? As long as possible. Yeah. You know, because I mean, I feel like I read the Bible and God's like, well, you if if you're not if you don't have the heart of a child, you're not you ain't doing it right. And I'm like, well, how could I have the heart of a child when we're at war and we're at we're, this is right. happening and that's happening right, and like right. and they don't they don't know any of that stuff yet, you know. Yeah. And so we really just try to we try to be as honest as we can without the confusion. And how has uh, Thomas having four daughters impacted you as a husband to Lauren? I just had to sit back and like reprioritize my life. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, yep. if music was number one for the last eight years, music is now, like, number three. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Like, I love it, and I want to be great at it. But, like, if me being great at music makes my parenting and my husband yeah. role suffer, yeah, what's it worth when I'm 50? What's it worth? Yeah. You know what I mean? You're right. You're right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. good. You've got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? You know what? Our hearts are ready for something like this. Come on. It's, it's a great thing. workout. It's yeah. everything Actually, you need. Who comes back together? Oh, I'm so, so happy. happy. I mean, that's what it takes to set a record. So glad to see you. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Who is this? Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. good. You've got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? Sounds so good. I love it. To cover the news, you have to be in it. These are families trying to board those trains to Poland. I also want to get home. You'll get home. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. I remember interviewing you when you hadn't won an award and it was all brand new, and now you're just such a staple and such a name. What What is it like now when you stand up on a stage and the stadium is full? Is it like <clears throat> what it was before? What does it feel like for you? 
I still pinch myself. Yeah. Um, and I'm also, I'm also a perfectionist. I think in some good ways, but mostly a fault, um, mm-hmm. which maybe maybe leads back to my comparison issue uh-huh. because I, I walk out there and I go, gosh, this place holds fifteen thousand people, but there's there's fourteen thousand nine hundred here. <laughs> like, I'm like, where's the other hundred at? You know what I mean? Like, but but then I walk out there and I go, golly, it feels like yesterday that I was twenty one years old. Yeah. You know, opening for. Who, whoever it was. Were you competitive about everything? Like, did you play sports when you were a kid? Yeah. Yeah. So you very, always wanted to win. Very yeah. competitive. Yeah. With everything, that's just your in your DNA. Yeah. Like, I have this weird fear of just like not not being the best, I, huh. and I don't know where that comes from, but it but it happens in every area of my life. Like, I can go back and remember playing. I was playing Monopoly with Lauren when we were sixteen years old. <laughs> And she's really good at math, and I'm real like I just learned how to tip three years ago, um, <laughs> and she beat me, and I was like, I don't want to play Monopoly Monopoly with you anymore. <laughs> You're so crazy. And even with my hobbies, like when I when I get into a hobby, yeah, I go hard. Like what? Well, what? Give me a hobby. Fly fishing, hunting, oh, yeah. skiing. Yeah. Like I gotta have the best equipment. I gotta watch a million YouTubes. I gotta hire a a trainer we need to get into this what is this no this is deep in your psyche since you're a kid yeah and like i think i'm I'm about to go on a kind of a weird tangent Mm -hmm. when i'm getting to a point i i think the reason i hate hate so bad and like Mm -hmm. instagram hatred or Mm -hmm. just even posting a song and someone being like this sucks yeah like that should be able to roll off my back yeah but it doesn't like it sticks with me for weeks yeah. And I go back into my sixth grade self yeah. and like I was kind of a, I won't say an outcast, but I was, uh, I just wanted to be different than everybody else. You know what I mean? Like if it was cool to play football, I wanted to start a lacrosse team. Uh-huh. If it was cool, if it was cool to listen to the Backstreet Boys, I wanted to listen to the Ramones. Uh-huh. And I was in sixth grade and me and some buddies started a punk rock band. And on the night of prom, we scheduled our first concert because we were like anti-prom. You know what I mean? Probably because we didn't get asked or no one wanted to go with us. That was probably the real reason. But I remember we put these flyers up in the hallway, like come to see the high heel flip-flops at whoever's house. Yeah. And there was somebody on the football team that went through the hallway and ripped all of our flyers down Uh and just started shredding them in half. Uh And that was the first moment that I said, I will be better than that. I will always be a bigger person than that. I'm about to cry even talking about it, yeah. but I, I don't know if that was where my uh, desire to prove people wrong so much came into play, but I, I can I can go back in my brain and see that so vividly. And so anytime anyone does something unique or weird or different in country music, in pop music, in sports, in whatever, when someone wants to tear somebody down for something, I'm like, you need to sit down. Sit down. Because yes. you don't know. I know we, we've been talking about life and it makes me so happy, but let me just get to your music because <laughs> yeah. I feel like it's evolving too. You were writing songs before you were singing them uh, publicly yeah. and you still had, like I was surprised at such a young age you had so much stuff to say. Like I didn't even know you lived enough life to say those things and now <laughs> they're getting deeper even yet, but I feel like you must have lived a lot of life uh, even when, when, you, when you were young. Yeah, I feel like I did. You know, like I, I mean, I think... You know, our life, every every bit of trauma in our lives shapes us in a way, you know, whether, and you get to choose for the worse or the better, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, d- divorce is not a fun thing to go through, mm-hmm. you know, as a kid. And for a long time, I didn't think it affected me until I started to become an adult and I started to pull out little bits of pieces of how mm-hmm. that did affect me. And, you know, uh, knowing Lauren and knowing certain people in our lives that had passed away way too early, like you kind of go, well, that's just life. But then you go, no, like, that sucks, that and sucks. that that affected yeah. you, you know. And yeah. I think I've always just been a really old soul. Um, mm-hmm. Like I think I've always been an overthinker and thought about my future probably way more than your average eighteen or nineteen year old kid, mm-hmm. you know. Um, mm-hmm. And so at a young age, like I really was trying to be older than my my driver's license said. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. Which is a good song title. We'll write that together. Yeah, um, that's a good one. <laughs> I've always just wanted to make sure that whatever I said, I mean, I've definitely released songs that were just for fun and just for yeah, you to dance to. But for the most part, if you hand me a guitar, I, I do want to write something uh, 
meaningful, you know, and, and something that someone across the world can hear by accident and be like, man, I've, I've felt that. I felt I've, that. I've been I there. Uh-huh. I've had that heartbreak. I've had that joy, you know. Um, uh-huh. And so a lot of people ask, like, why I get so personal in my songs, and it's like really the only way I know how to do it. You know, like yeah, I, I've great. tried to write, a quote, unquote, just like a hit, you know, mm-hmm. like, oh, this mm-hmm. would sound good on the radio. And I've definitely had a few of those. But for the most mm-hmm. part, if I can write my honest truth and it be a hit, that is mm-hmm. uh, that's the Mecca there right there. So, well, uh, Thomas, I just want to say it's always such a treat to visit and talk with you. Likewise. I love your music. We're going to be just it, it's my happy place, man. <laughs> I hit Thomas Rhett Radio, Thomas, Thomas Rhett on Spotify. And um, I just can't wait to, to see you soon. Well, likewise, Hoda. I hope you have a great day. Thank you so much for talking with me. Thanks again. And is now facing multiple charges for attacking seven Asian women around Lower Manhattan. Surveillance video in Little Saigon capturing one of the at least 70 robberies in the Bay Area targeting Asian women. Remember a woman who was stalked and stabbed to death in her own home. Sparking pain and outrage. New York City has failed AAPIs and Asians. We do not feel safe. This is about the community and and our elected officials need to do something much different. My hope is that we stop otherizing folks and recognize that uh, we all want the same thing. We know that this is a community effort beyond just AAPI. We all have each other's back. Vicki Wynn, thank you for joining us for our second racism virus special report. It's time for another honest conversation about what it means to be Asian American. We're spotlighting the progress made over the past year, as well as the unprecedented hate, discrimination, and violence Asians in America are still facing. And yet, in a recent survey, one in three Americans said they were unaware of the spike in anti-Asian hate and racism over the past year. A lot of it came into sharper focus during the pandemic, with one in five people surveyed saying Asian Americans are at least partly responsible for COVID-19. So the problem persists and it remains stubbornly and dangerously under the radar. Tonight, we're gonna talk to trailblazers and activists about the ways the community is combating the hate with meaningful change, including actor Daniel Day Kim, now working on what may be one of his most important roles as activist. He joins us to talk about the lessons learned during this violent period, as well as his new job on the White House task force looking to build equity and opportunity for Asian Americans. We'll catch up with Jeremy Lin, who has encountered hate and discrimination on the basketball court. For the very first time, you're going to hear the inspiring story of the first Asian American to officiate an NFL game. And we'll also talk about increasing representation for the Asian American Pacific Islander community with Survivor winner Yul Kwan and popular blogger Phil Yu, better known as Angry Asian Man. But first, New York City has been home to some high profile cases of attacks on Asian Americans. The NYPD is the largest police agency in the country and efforts here to curb hate crimes often have a ripple effect nationwide. I spoke exclusively with the department's chief of detectives on how the NYPD is handling the wave of violence against Asian Americans. A warning, some of the content you're about to see is disturbing. The first viral videos were shocking. At the start of the pandemic, elderly Asians attacked, slowly spreading fear throughout the Asian American community. Two years later, the violence continues. In December, six men arrested in San Jose. Police there say the suspects are tied to more than 70 cases of burglary, robbery, and theft, targeting primarily Asian Americans in California. Five of the suspects have pled not guilty. These suspects believe that they could prey on these victims um, because of their ethnicity. He just walked up and punched. In Boston, a 70-year-old woman says she was punched in the face by a stranger in Chinatown. Reports of hate crimes are up across all minority groups, but according to the Center for the Study of Hate and Extremism, Asian Americans are seeing the biggest spike. From 2020 to 2021, the number of anti-Asian incidents reported across major cities increased 224%. 
New York City making national headlines for brutal crimes against Asians. NYPD's chief of detectives, James Essig, leads the department's 4,000 detectives, including the Hate Crime Task Force, which is now under new leadership. He met us for an exclusive interview in Chinatown, just blocks away from where 35-year-old Christina Yuna Lee was followed home and murdered. You know, one thing with the Asian hate crimes more than any other particular ethnic group, it's personal. They're getting punched in the face, they're getting spit on, they be pushed. Three months ago, police say a man attacked seven Asian women in a three-hour period. He now faces 13 hate crime charges and has pled not guilty. Have you seen the Asian American community as out front on an issue like this? No, never. The Asian community is very uh, reserved, but never seen crimes like this against the Asians. It just seems like, I, again, two years ago, just astronomically spiked. According to NYPD, out of 37 reported anti-Asian hate crimes this year, 95% were physical attacks. While there were more anti-Semitic hate crimes, 75% were property crimes. Chief Essig encourages victims to come forward. We have spoken with some people who say that when they did come forward, that they felt that they were brushed off or that they were discouraged mm -hmm. from reporting the hate crime. Mm -hmm. Are you concerned about that? Well, from, from my perspective as the chief of detectives, when we get that case, uh, we're going to do a, a full investigation. What's your message to the officers taking these reports? Well, taking the report, they don't fall under me. If somebody comes to the police and they're reporting something, we have to take everything seriously. And especially a hate crime. If that's the case, then we have to do a hell of a lot better job. Essex says even if a crime isn't technically charged as a hate incident, these unprovoked attacks are traumatizing, especially for Asian American women. It's just very anxiety inducing and you, you don't feel safe. After Michelle Goh was pushed onto the subway tracks, demonstrators rallied. Whether it's conscious or subconscious, the way she looked played a role in why she was the ultimate victim. A recent study shows that out of more than 10,000 hate incidents, 61% were reported by women. My mother-in-law is Asian American and, and she's been victim of this. Denver Police Chief Paul Pazin says hate crimes have a ripple effect and need to be fully investigated. When we're talking about bias motivated crimes or hate crimes, uh, it goes far beyond just the person that was the victim of this. Often it creates trauma for an entire community. Do you think there is a renewed push to get prosecutions? Absolutely. And I, and I hear it from uh, our other law enforcement partners across the country. Over the past year, actor and activist Daniel Day Kim, he was among the first to speak out against Asian hate, even offering a $25,000 reward along with actor Daniel Wu to help catch an attacker. Now he's on President Biden's AAPI Visibility Task Force. I had a chance to speak with DDK on his new role and what he hopes to accomplish. So good to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us. Always good to see you, Vicky. Okay, so let me talk to you recently you talked about how you have noticed a lot of changes in the Asian American community and, and how we've responded to the spike in anti-Asian sentiment. What has struck you about the community's response? I think uh, first and foremost, we've galvanized in a way that I've never seen before. Uh, not just through uh, organizations emerging that haven't been there, but you know, I was talking to some uh, people who have uh, nonprofits uh, and community and who are community organizers, and they're saying they've never had uh, a greater number of donations than they had o over the past year and uh, and a half or so, and that's really encouraging. Daniel, you testified before the House Judiciary Committee on Asian Hate. This happened last year. I want to give our audience a listen to part of your testimony. What happens right now and over the course of the coming months will send a message for generations to come as to whether we matter, whether the country we call home chooses to erase us or include us, dismiss us or respect us, invisibilize us or see us. It's so powerful what you said. And just a few days after your speech, the president signed into law the anti-Asian hate crime bill. That legislation, just so our audience knows, it directs funding to help make it easier for people to report hate crimes, in part because it directs resources to local and state governments and law enforcement agencies. It also puts uh, reporting into multiple languages. What more do you think the government should or could be doing to address discrimination? Right now, as encouraged as we are, 
by the passage of that bill, we are now now focused uh, on how we can actually make it happen. How? What are the logistics of how, getting that those funds to the right places? How can we streamline this, and how can we actually appropriate the funding uh, to make it the most effective? Talk to us about this AAPI task force. It was formed last December by the White House. You're one of 23 members of this task force. What have you all been working on? Uh, it's a great question. We're actually going to be convening for the first time in person uh, in a couple of weeks. We've been meeting on a regular basis uh, to uh, to provide a set of recommendations to the president about how we can move forward from the events of uh, the, the past couple of years and how we can most effectively change policy and affect policy so that we can create a better environment, not just for Asian Americans, but for equality in general. You know, some of the things that we're working on specifically are how we can implement uh, the terms of the, the No Hate Bill and how we can uh, effectively get money out to the community and, and best uh, utilize uh, everything that the bill hopes to be. Do you get any pushback, Daniel? Are people saying, you're an actor, stay in your lane? <laughs> Stay out of politics. Yes, I do. Uh, you know, I remember uh, a famous basketball player who was an activist uh, was told to shut up and dribble. Uh, and I've been told to shut up and act. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, it, it's beyond being an actor, you know, that's my job. But I'm also a human being. I'm also a citizen. I'm also a voter. And I think all of us who are, are those things, um, you know, should have an opinion, an informed opinion about uh, the world around us. And uh, I happen to have a platform that I'm able to use, and I hope I use it judiciously to kind of shine a light on issues that are important. You have also talked very passionately about how this isn't just an Asian American issue, that people of color and marginalized communities need to come together to be allies. Are you seeing that happen, you know, in this past year? What have you seen? And also, how do we foster these allyships? I'm really encouraged by the fact that groups like the Asian American Foundation have been working with other groups like the NAACP. We're trying to, and you know, we've we've been working with the King Foundation as well. And these are ways to find intersectionality because we understand and recognize that this is a larger problem. When you talk about intersectionality, what do you mean by that? It's about recognizing the fact that uh, what's affected certain groups uh, has is is part of a larger issue that affects other groups, and that we're mm -hmm. all interconnected. And so, finding ways that our experiences literally intersect with one another is then is a is a is a really powerful way of finding common ground, so that we can work together to solve the issues that that actually affect all of us. Daniel, finally, let me ask you about something you said in a recent interview with T-Mobile. You said pressure makes diamonds and our community has been under pressure. Tell me more about that. And what do you think the pressure is that still faces the Asian American community? I think it's the pressure of invisibility. I think it's a pressure of misperception, uh, stereotyping, and just a lack of awareness. We, There is pressure for our community to speak up and speak out and to come together and to make sure that the people who can uh, affect policy hear us and understand that that we are a constituency that deserves respect. And so th that is a kind of pressure that that previous generations haven't really faced when it comes to Asian America. So I see it as an opportunity to really further our, uh, our, our status in this country and raise awareness of, about who we really are and, and, and how essential we are to the fabric of America. And our shared goals Thank you, Daniel Dekim. A pleasure to speak to you. As always, we really appreciate your insight and checking in with you one year later. Of course, always, always happy to talk to you, Vicky. <laughs> a look at the grassroots efforts, the Stop AAPI Hate Coalition formed just a week after the WHO declared a COVID-19 a pandemic. Well, that has been instrumental in tracking anti-Asian attacks across the U.S. Joining us now, Cynthia Che with Stop AAPI Hate and Kareem Farishta from the Asian American Foundation, also known as TAF. It's a nonprofit committed to creating a sense of belonging for all Asian American Pacific Islanders. Thank you both for being here. Cynthia, I want to start with you. The coalition released national reports that track anti-Asian attacks. It is also recommendations and policies for addressing these hate crimes. Why is this data so important and how does it inform lawmakers and other leaders? 
Well, you know, we started Stop API Hate because uh, our experience has been that without the documentation, that our experiences are um, overlooked and minimized. And so with our data, we have been able to demonstrate that anti-Asian racism and hate incidents um, are an everyday experience for our community. And certainly that was catalyzed by COVID-19. So it's being used to advocate for meaningful change. And we're really mm -hmm. proud that we've been able to play a role in that. I know we refer to the data at NBC News. The national report, the latest one you've released, said over 10,000 hate incidents have been reported to stop AAPI hate since it started. That's over 4,000 in 2020 and 6,000 in 2021. That's not a good trend. What do you think is behind the increase in these reported incidents? Well, what I can say is that when we started Stop API Hate, um, you know, we were actually surprised by the number of people who reported to us their their everyday experience with racism. And people are telling us what they and their loved ones are experiencing out in public and um, in places that are open. Mm -hmm. And sometimes these reports don't even go to the police. Kareem, let me turn to you. We talk a lot about the model minority myth and often that stereotype, that foreigner stereotype as well, it casts a shadow over our community. There was a report by TAF as well as Launch that found just 29% of Asian Americans actually f agree with the statement that they feel fully accepted here in the U.S. Talk to us about the dangers of those stereotypes and how do we combat them, not just us, but also groups that are in our allies. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Vicki, for having me on today. And thanks for your reporting on this really important matter. The model minority myth often pin paints the Asian American community with broad brushstrokes. Mm -hmm. So the Asian American community has some of the highest levels of income disparity, the highest wage earners, as well as the lowest wage earners within the Asian American community. What happens is when we're painted uh, through the same lens, we're painted as a monolith. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't allow us to see the entire diversity of the community. At the end of the day, it reduces us and paints us through harmful tropes and stereotypes. So the reality of the situation is that Asian Americans today are feeling that those stereotypes are leading to scapegoating. And that scapegoating is leading to violence. Talk to me about TAF. You raised so much money when you came out to help with you know, Asian Americans and all of these issues. How are you measuring where that money is going? It's really important that the Asian American Foundation is committed to creating an irrevocable sense of belonging. We came together in the aftermath of the Atlanta spa shootings. And we realized that in order to end the trajectory of hate, we need to do more to build belonging. And in order to, to really change the trajectory of this country, we're doing more to address AAPI bullying in classrooms. Mm -hmm. We're also working to protect our elders. We're working in cities like Chicago and Oakland and New York, cities that have had a high preponderance of eight, cities that have high densities of AAPI communities mm -hmm. to create an irrevocable sense of belonging and making sure that we're doing this work alongside our allies in making sure that this work is cross-racial it is cross-religious and it lifts everyone up because everyone is impacted by the rise in anti-Asian hate. Kareem Farishta from the Asian American Foundation as well as Cynthia Che, thank you both so much for joining us. When we come back, Trailblazer, an exclusive interview with the first Asian American the NFL has hired to officiate its games. What it took for him to make it to the top of the sport plus lifting the taboo on mental health for Asian Americans. But first, a look at some of the work being done in our communities around the country, as reported by some of our NBC affiliates. Here in the Washington DC area, celebrations for Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month are tempered by continuing efforts to stop Asian hate. DC has launched a new campaign called Hate Stops With Us. This is an effort to prevent anti-Asian hate crimes, harassment and violence experienced over the course of the pandemic. City leaders say they're working to support victims of these kinds of attacks, while also working to train teachers in public schools about the rise in anti-Asian hate and provide resources to 
teach tolerance in the classroom. In Maryland, the Asian American Hate Crimes Work Group was tasked with developing strategies and actions to address the rise in violence and discrimination targeting the AAPI community. And in Virginia, leaders are encouraging anyone who experiences anti-Asian hate or harassment to report the incident to police and to stop AAPI hate, a national coalition dedicated to documenting and stopping anti-Asian hate and discrimination throughout the country. Many victims in our area say they're frustrated that their attackers have not been brought to justice and they want more to be done to keep them safe. Eun Yang, NBC4, Washington. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia. Could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. You've got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? Sounds so good. I love it. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia. Could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia, could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. You've got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? You know what? Our hearts are ready for something like this. Yeah. It's a great workout. It's yeah. everything that's you right. need. What comes back together? Oh, I'm so, so happy. happy. I mean, that's what it takes to set a record. So glad to see you. Hallie Jackson now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. So Jam, my sister, she had a patient who refused actually to work with her because he thought she was Chinese. Does that make the problem feel that much closer to home? And as a parent, how does that make you feel? Yeah, I mean, I think... Certainly the, the fact that, you know, when it's as close to your own daughter, um, yeah, it feels, it feels pretty close to home. I, I'm, I guess I'm in part surprised, right? And saddened um, and also maybe a little angry that, you know, someone would, would think that, right? Um, and, and, you know, kind of goes against what, you know, the, the Martin Luther King ideals were, right? That people, are not judged by the color of their skin, but you know, um, the content of the character, what they know, or how, you know, as a physical therapist, you know, how much value she can bring. And that's, that's you know, that's sad. As anti-Asian hate made headlines over the past two years, it didn't dim the spotlight on important firsts to celebrate. The world was introduced to the first Asian American Marvel superhero with Simu Liu starring in Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. And Domi Shi became the first woman Pixar hired to direct Turning Red, a coming of age movie featuring an immigrant family. And now we turn to a trailblazer on the field, Lo Van Pham. His parents fled Vietnam before he was born. So growing up, Lo bounced around refugee camps in Laos, Thailand, and the Philippines before coming to the U.S. as a child. He grew up in Texas where he fell in love with sports and he went on to become an engineer, but he still had the desire to connect with the game. So for fun, he started officiating Pee Wee football games on the weekend and he worked his way up to Division I college football. Now Lowe is breaking ground as the first Asian American to officiate in the NFL. 
Welcome, Lo. Congratulations. So good to speak with you. Talk to me about this. When you were first officiating Pee Wee games, you did that obviously because you love football. When did you start thinking about doing it for the NFL? Was this even part of the dream? No, it was really never part of the dream. You know, when I first started, I just wanted to be the best official I had. I was at the Pee Wee level. You know, it really didn't become a dream until probably two or three years ago when I was invited to participate in the ODP program, which is the official development program that the NFL has generated to try to train and uh, hopefully look at the future candidates for the National Football League. I love it. What does it mean for you to be the first Asian American officiating in the National Football League? And also, how have people responded to you taking on this job? Well, the response has been overwhelming. You know, I, I, it hasn't really hit me yet, Vicky. I just, it's kind of been soaking in the mold. But, you know, my first thought when I got the call was, I now have really, I have to really work hard to, to try to do a good job for the National Football League. And like I said, it's, it's just been, a surreal moment here in the last week or so just to be kind of the first Asian American to be invited to work in the national football field as a field official. It's a it's a big honor. I'm very privileged and very proud. And it's really for the people that's been around me. It's not really it's for myself, but for the supporters, my family, my friends. I have people just coming from all over to say thank you so much and keep continuing the, the hard work. And I'm just so blessed right now to be a part of this. Yeah, I know this. I mean, there's a saying, if you can see it, you can be it. You didn't see it, but you are still there. What's your message to young people who are watching this and seeing someone that looks like them for the first time doing something they may dream of doing? Oh, the message is, you know, that, that whatever dreams that you have, whatever, despite where you come from, you know, if you work hard enough and you have a dream and a desire and you're passionate about something, you know, anything's possible in this great country of ours gives us the tool and the means and mechanism to do it. And so, yes, I, I highly encourage, you know, other minorities, uh, Asian Americans. I know there's a whole lot of, you know, Asian American kids out there that play. So after you play, and, and if it's not something that's in your bloodline, then obviously officiating is another avenue to be part of the sport. It's a great, great resource and it's a great opportunity to, to just, just experience the American dream. Talk to us about what made you fall in love with the sport of football. You came here to the U.S. as a refugee, but you actually did play. And also, what does it take to be a great officiant? You know what? I fell in love with just actually just kind of being part of part of the sport, you know, just being out there with, with the guys, the gracefulness of the sport, the power of the sport, the speed of the sport, and, and all of the, the, the team aspect of the sport. And... You know, when I played in high school, it was just something I just kind of fell in love with. And when I graduated, I wasn't a part of that any longer. And so I wanted to still be on the field and be, I want to be able to contribute on the field. And it's just a, you know, it's just something that's I'm not sure where I got it from. It was just kind of when I moved here and played when I was a youngster, it just kind of stuck with me and fell in love with me. And, you know, I'm glad I did it. It was something to, to pass my time you know, after I got, a, got out of college. And it's, you know, it's been a wonderful experience, just, you know, to say the least. And it's a ride that took you all the way to the NFL. Can't wait to see you out there in your black and white. Low Van fam, thank you for speaking with us. Thank you, Vicki. From one trailblazer to another, we are talking about basketball sensation Jeremy Lin. He's the first Asian American to win an NBA championship. As reports of Asians being attacked started to surface back in 2020, Jeremy Lin was one of the first to call attention to the hate and violence, and he joins us now from California. Jeremy, it is great to see you again. Now, you made some headlines last year when you talked about being called coronavirus on the court when you were playing for the NBA G League. There's trash talk, and then there's this. And you never identified the player, but you wanted to show that anti-Asian discrimination was widespread, even in pro sports. Talk to us about the challenges of the past year. How has it been for you since speaking up? And also, what is most encouraging to you about using your platform in this way? It's been quite a year. Um, so I ended up playing um, the season in China. But as I was reading on everything that was happening in the United States, it was just uh, definitely a heavy heart, for sure. You know, there's a report that came out that, that said Asian, you know, Asian Americans or API are leading um, in the rate of suicide and 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 the bullying and the 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 hate that is going on is leading to really detrimental mental health effects of a lot of API. But at the same time, what I've seen in the last years, there's definitely also 
more conversation, mm -hmm. um, more awareness, more willingness to talk about these things. Yeah, the ongoing conversation, definitely a positive sign. And Jeremy, this past year, in addition to playing in China, you've also been working really hard to create some tangible solutions that help uplift Asian American voices and empower the community. Talk to us about some of these initiatives. So the foundation, uh, the Jeremy Foundation, we want to find and identify grantees that are doing really good work on the ground. And we're trying to really just empower the next generation of, of AAPI youth. And, and, you know, when we talk to the kids in, in the grantees, man, there's so many stories. There's, there was like one call that I was on where the kids were so, so proud to be Asian. It made me smile because I never felt that growing up. This next generation, they're, they're proud. They're trying to speak out. They're trying to talk about mental health. They're trying to talk, talk about representation. And so we're just trying to be, play a small part in allowing AAPI to have a lot more access mm -hmm. and equity in their lives. It has to fill your heart to know that your foundation is working to help that next generation. I want to talk about the 10 years ago. It's been 10 years, if you can believe it, since Lynn Sanity swept the nation in response to your incredible performance during the 2011-2012 season with the New York Knicks. Now, a new documentary is looking at your story, your legacy, the NBA. It's set to uh, premiere at the Tribeca Film Festival. Let's take a listen. As amazing as that moment was, it was just a brief, brief moment. Now we realize just how far we are from where we want to be. No one's telling little Asian American boys, you need to grow up to be an NBA basketball star. This face is always read as being alien, a betrayer, a spy. We all know what it took for him to get there. Asian Americans have been yearning for someone to do something like this. Jeremy, talk to me about some of the lessons that are highlighted in this documentary that you want people to reflect on. We're celebrating just what that moment meant, because even for me, when it was happening, I didn't realize just the level and the layers of the impact and the meaning that it had across the board. And as I started to continue to go through my professional career, I realized people are still talking about mm -hmm. it. And I'm like, you guys haven't forgotten about it? 10 years later, and then even, even in the height of COVID, when New York was really going through it, the New York Knicks could have done anything and they chose to broadcast an Insanity Week. And I was like, wow, this story really impacted people. And so we're touching on the impact of the story in the first half, and then we're gonna tie it into the, the current uh, you know, climate of what we're dealing with with Asian hate. We look forward to seeing it, and I think Linsanity is going to live on for a very long time. Jeremy Lin, friend of the show, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Good to see you again. Still to come, meet an Atlanta mom who is turning tragedy into triumph. How the deadly spa shootings became a flashpoint for her to push for change. And later, Phil Yu, perhaps better known as the popular angry Asian man, talks about the importance of how Asian Americans are properly represented in the media. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. You got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? Sounds so good. I love it. News is happening now. Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. These are families trying to board those trains to Poland. I also want to get home. You'll get home. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. To cover the news, you have to be in it. These are families trying to board those trains to Poland. I also want to get home. 
you'll get home. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia. Could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. NBC News, streaming free now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. It's been a little more than a year since the Atlanta area spa shootings. Eight people were killed. Six were women of Asian descent. The tragedy added to an already violent year. While the shooting sent shockwaves and fear throughout the AAPI community, some used it as an opportunity to push for change. Richard Louie has more from one mom on a mission. That rampage in the Atlanta area that left at least eight people dead. This has rattled the Asian American community. Investigators are not ruling out a hate crime. That was March 16th, 2021, right here, the Atlanta spa shootings. For some, it was just a tragedy. Yet for others, it was the defining flashpoint for a generation of change makers. What was your first reaction when you heard that happened? Those are the women that reminded me of my mom and the women that my mom goes to church with, the women that when I was growing up really prayed for me, they took care of me, and it really felt like family had been murdered. The mom of three, Won Hee Shin, mobilized to create Asian American voices for education. With the rise of anti-Asian hate crimes and also after the spa shooting, which was only seven miles from here, there was this kind of like a desire that I think a lot of Asian Americans felt for the route to change, which is this perception that we are foreigners forever. Mm -hmm. And that is because of miseducation. I didn't know that there is a story of Asian Americans in this country since the beginning. So the organization started with the aim of incorporating Asian American history into the Georgia state curriculum and quickly expanded to be even more inclusive. If we just say we're doing only Asian American history, then we're actually not doing anyone's service because history cannot be told unless it's all stories being told because one led to the other. It's an interwoven thing. The group is trying to show educators how these stories can be interwoven into lesson plans. One example, Ruby Bridges, who at six became the first African-American student to integrate an elementary school in the South. When students learn about Ruby Bridges, stories of other young girls who helped desegregate can be incorporated, like Chinese-American Mamie Tape in the late 1800s and indigenous student Alice Piper in the 1920s. While some states like Illinois and New Jersey have mandated Asian-American studies as part of their public school curriculums, there are similar pushes across the country. Whether big or small, change calls for collaboration. New social entrepreneurs like Wan He Shin turn to established groups. Berenice Rodriguez, the organizing and civic engagement director of Asian Americans Advancing Justice Atlanta, helped Wan He. For students to have knowledge of different ethnicities, racial groups is very important. I think that creates empathy between one another. This education issue is just one of several for Asian Americans Advancing Justice Atlanta. Talk about how Georgia is unique for this whole idea of coming together. We have a rich history of the civil rights movement and a rich history of black activism. I think that that lends itself to more cross-racial solidarity in order to really have real power. I think we understand that we have to work across racial lines. Just like Wan He is working for representation of all communities in the curriculum. It's about humanity as a whole and how we all, it's all of our narratives that play into this world. We're not living in this a bubble by ourselves. Do you hope that your three children, because of your work yeah. and what Avid is doing, will have a different educational experience before they graduate from college? Yes, I know they will. It can only get better. Her message resonating with her kids, Aiden, Bennett, and Catherine. Your mom said that she's doing this for you. Um, uh, she is speaking. She says she's speaking for you. 
I feel like kind of like yes and no because she's not only speaking for us but speaking for, for other people too. Are you proud of your mom? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I'm glad she's working hard just to like give us an opportunity, give the next kind of generation, I guess, it just a better shot. Richard Louie, NBC News, Atlanta. Our thanks to Richard Louie for that story. The rise of anti-Asian racism has taken a toll on the mental health of the AAPI community. Pre-pandemic, one in 10 Asian Americans reported psychological distress, such as anxiety and depression. During the pandemic, that number rose to more than four in 10. Joining me now is Dr. Jenny Wang, a clinical psychologist and author of Permission to Come Home, Reclaiming Mental Health as Asian Americans. Also with us, Yul Kwan, the first Asian American winner of the hit reality TV show, Survivor. Thank you both so much for being here. Dr. Wang, first to you. With the ongoing racism and recent attacks as people are out doing daily activities or taking public transit, a lot of folks are just scared about going back to work or doing their normal routines. What do you say to people who are anxious about being out in public after seeing these videos and headlines? I would say that the fear and anxiety is valid, right? That fear and anxiety functions to protect us from environments that feel threatening or overwhelming. The problem with fear and anxiety is that if we don't have a corresponding action that follows that, it can lead to rumination and worry. So I often say, what could we do? What action can we take? Is it finding you know, protective devices? Is it finding different ways to get to work safely? What actions can we take that then diminishes the fear? Thank you, Dr. Wang. Yule, last year, you shared some really moving details about bullying and racism that you experienced growing up and how that has impacted you today as an adult. We're going to play a clip for our audience. Older white kids would bully a lot of the younger uh, minority kids in the bathroom. And what they would try to do is they'd try to grab us and hold us against the wall while they would take turns pissing on us. And that gave me uh, this fear of going to public restrooms. And I developed a condition known as paruresis, which is known as shy bladder syndrome. And I think a lot of my kind of early trauma really got me to think deeply about why it is that I was bullied, why I felt this way, why I felt alienated. Yule, it was deeply personal, and we heard from so many viewers who felt it was one of the most memorable moments, in part because outwardly, right, you're so successful, you're strong. My goodness, I mean, you won Survivor. So why was it that you wanted to share that vulnerable moment and how it shaped you, and what are you hoping people take from that? Sure. Um, well, I guess two reasons why I shared. Uh, you know, the first is, as I mentioned, while I was growing up, and for most of my adult life, I was afraid to tell people about the psychological trauma and the health problems that I suffered in part as a result of bullying and other challenges. You know, there's such a heavy stigma against mental health issues, especially in the AAPI community, uh, which often views these as defects of character rather than something that should be met with empathy and support. So for me, I really struggled in silence for years, and I didn't seek out the help that I think could have made a difference earlier in my life. And I think that if I had seen or heard someone like me talking about these issues openly, you know, I would have felt a little bit less lonely. I would have felt maybe a little bit more hopeful that maybe I could find a way to cope with these problems and not let my fears and anxieties predetermine what my life would be, a life of loneliness. And for me, especially now that I have children, it's been top of mind for me because even with my two girls, I can see some of these anxieties emerging in them. And I want them to know that it's okay to talk about these problems openly, that it's okay to ask for help and that they can always come to me and other people and then I'll always meet them with understanding and love. Dr. Jenny Wang and Yul Kwan, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure for us to see you, and I know that you make so many other people feel seen. Coming up, the effort to increase representation of Asian Americans in Hollywood and pop culture. First, NBC's Frances Rivera, whose family is from the Philippines, speaks to her mother on why they moved to America. When I saw the United States, it was a place of opportunity and I had an incident in the Philippines during the martial law when I have a family friend that was picked up because of the word rumor mongering and I knew that I could not bring my kids on not having a speech uh, freedom of speech and then we decided that that was the time for us to pack that 
and try to go to the United States. To cover the news, you have to be in it. These are families trying to board those trains to Poland. I also want to get home. You'll get home. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Can this still end diplomatically with Vladimir Putin in charge of Russia? Our promise to take in 100,000 Ukrainian refugees. Is that enough? The circus-like stuff that the hearings turned into. This system seems broken. What do we do? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Can this still end diplomatically with Vladimir Putin in charge of Russia? Our promise to take in 100,000 Ukrainian refugees. Is that enough? The circus-like stuff that the hearings turned into. This system seems broken. What do we do? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. This is a critical choke point for this fire. And good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia, could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? Can this still end diplomatically with Vladimir Putin in charge of Russia? Our promise to take in 100,000 Ukrainian refugees. Is that enough? The circus-like stuff that the hearings turned into. This system seems broken. What do we do? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. The rise in anti-Asian sentiment has done a lot of things for a lot of members of the Asian American Pacific Islander community. I'm kind of a little bit more keenly focused now on, on things like health and safety or being aware of my surroundings or, or, or what could be considered a high or higher risk situation or, or environment to be in. Um, one of the things that I think that's been the most telling for me is the fact that I fear for my family, my, my parents in particular. And that fear is one that many Asian American children share for their parents too. Dominic Chu, thank you. In the last year, we have seen major movies and TV shows feature strong Asian leads like Shang-Chi, Turning Red, and Bridgerton. And more is to come with the release of Ms. Marvel and a Crazy Rich Asians spinoff. We're also seeing more Asian Americans uh, as content creators. They're making a distinct space for themselves, but it certainly has not been easy. Joining us now is Bing Chen, founder and president of Gold House, which is dedicated to advancing Asian representation in business and media, and blogger Phil Yu, who is also known as Angry Asian Man. Thank you both for being here. I'm gonna start with you, Bing. As someone who's in the room where these decisions are being made about representation, what kinds of conversations are you having with these executives about diversity? Not only because Hollywood thinks it feels good when they have representation, but it's better for the bottom line. Absolutely, and thank you so much for having me. Uh, Gold House, as you know, is now the first API call for every Hollywood studio to streamer. And I would summarize our experience as we win some and we have to work on some. Uh, on the work on some, there are still some studios and projects that are I'll call in transitional phase. For instance, we just had a conversation yesterday with one well-meaning, but who think that tokenized accents that add no creative or cultural contributions uh, are valuable and they're just simply not. And so there's just a lot of education that we have to inject in a lot of the DNA of these companies. Um, that being said, I would say the overwhelming majority are making truly material progress. Uh, the biggest revelation we've had in the last two years is that of course, if something is not diverse on screen, it really begins on the page and within all levels of workers. So how do we think thoughtfully about DNI and B training with all employees, not just executives who have these big mandates, 
uh, and how do we educate everybody? Thank you. And Phil, I want to ask you about this. Earlier, we were talking about the importance of visibility and busting that model minority stereotype that we're all successful or all well-educated when, in fact, that's not the case and Asian Americans have a high level of poverty. Um, you talked about this in the Netflix documentary, White Hot, and you talked about how Abercrombie and Fitch was trying to portray Asians. I want to give our viewers a look. The one that everybody remembers, Wong Brothers, advertising a fictional laundry service. Two Wongs can make it white. Asian Americans are often taught that like, you're supposed to just keep your head down, not rock the boat, especially as a lot of us are the children of immigrants. But I think at that moment, I was like, it's okay to be angry about this. Talk to us about what kind of impact that had, that messaging had on Asian Americans and how we viewed ourselves as well as how other communities viewed us. Because Abercrombie was hot at the time. Yeah, well, I think at the heart of it is that uh, represent representation matters. The way that people view us, it has an effect in the real world, the way that who creates these images, right? Um, at the heart of it is uh, who gets to tell our stories, um, do we get to tell our stories? Who deems what stories are important? And on that T-shirt, that's a story. And that's a story that, is, that rings false from my experience, but that is a popular image. And Abercrombie, being at the top of its game, was perpetuating this false image of me, even on a shirt, you know? And so I, th I felt that it was really important for people to speak out because honestly, you would see an image like that uh, growing up tons of times and you maybe just think like uh you know that's just a, it's just a joke you know with that that image has an additive effect and people over time begin to equate that shirt those images and images like that in movies and television with this when they see this and that has a we see it now has a detrimental effect when you can disassociate someone from their humanity it leads to terrible circumstances on the street Mm hmm. Bing, there's some criticism that Gold House focuses on elite images and specific kinds of Asian Americans. Can you talk to us about what you're doing to combat that? Is there truth to that? And, and what do you want to see highlighted in mainstream media? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we actually are uh, fully reflective of the APA diaspora, 20 percent South Asian, 30 percent Southeast Asian and at both employees as well as projects supported. So by the numbers, uh, we do uh, try to make sure that we're reflective of the diversity of our community. That being said, we also have one of the most diverse communities in the world. So as Phil just mentioned, we have the widest income disparity. We are stretched to multiple third culture kids across different nations. And so like many organizations, we continue to try to be inclusive there. I think secondly, on the uh, project side, uh, we look at this in several different ways. Uh, one is that more projects are better. Uh, we think that the more specific anyone is empowered to tell their story, whether it's with a studio or with independent projects that we finance, that more is more. And we constantly search out for even more projects. I think second, though, that is very there's something very difficult in our community is we won't just support any project. Right. Mm -hmm. um, candidly, there's something that is said behind closed doors in the community is we feel obligated to support all API projects because we want to be encouraging. But unfortunately, mm -hmm. when we support a project that's not high quality, it actually sends our community back in the eyes of those who are not in the community. And I think candidly, we are unfortunately still in the phase of the movement where we can only perpetuate in mass really high quality projects, right? Um, these are not just projects that are well financed, they're just good stories that are well told, right? Um, and so I think that's really where the criticism comes from. And that again is sort of a, a, a longer standing debate in the community. And Phil Yu, Angry Asian Man has done so much for this community. We hope you will continue speaking out. Thank you very, very much to both of you. Well, Thank we you. asked Amber Crabby and Fitch about the Netflix documentary. Here's what the company spokesperson said, quote, the shirts and the associated language and design were inexcusable 20 years ago when they were released, and they do not reflect A&F Company's values today. Fran Horowitz joined A&F Company in 2014, and since that time, she's ushered in a spirit of inclusiveness and equity. We encourage a culture of belonging across all of our brands, and we celebrate the individuality and authenticity of our global associates, customers, and communities. All right, when we come back, how people have risen up against the hate and violence to create allyships and support for each other.
I'm Karen Hua in Philadelphia, and here in the Philly region, the Asian population has grown by 39% in the past decade, according to the U.S. Census. That's an increase of about 37,000 people. Because of this demographic uptick, for the first time ever, voting materials are available in Chinese for the primary election this month. Another first this year, all Philly public schools got the whole day off to observe Lunar New Year as a holiday. These are all triumphs for the AAPI community, but they're happening at a time when Philly has not been immune to anti-Asian hate. In just the past year, Asian teens attacked on the subway, a mother allegedly robbed and beaten at knife point in her Chinatown home, and Penn professor Amy Wax going viral for saying the country would be better, quote, with fewer Asians. We are Asian Americans. We're going to stay. Our culture matters. I, I think it's so important, especially right now. Now, Philly is bouncing back from the pandemic, and the AAPI community here knows that being visible is all the more important. I'm Karen Hua. NBC 10 News, Philadelphia. Can this still end diplomatically with Vladimir Putin in charge of Russia? Our promise to take in 100,000 Ukrainian refugees. Is that enough? The circus-like stuff that the hearings turned into. This system seems broken. What do we do? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. News is happening now. Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. you got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? You know what? Our hearts are ready for something like this. Yeah. It's a great workout. It's yeah. everything Actually, you need. Who comes back together? Oh, I'm so, so happy. happy. That's what it takes to set a record. So glad to see you. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world. Because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. you got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? are ready for something like this. Yeah. It's a great workout. It's yeah. everything Actually, you need. Who comes back together? Oh, I'm so, so happy. happy. That's what it takes to set a record. So glad to see you. During difficult times, there are those who rise above, people fighting to make things better. NBC News Asian America is highlighting that with its project AAPI Action, 100 Ways Communities and Allies Have Found Solutions to Racism and Violence. NBC News Asian America reporter Kimmy Yam is here now with a roundup. And Kimmy, let's start with number one, the project's uh, COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act that was signed into law by President Biden. Right, um, Vicky. well, first off, thank you for having me. I feel like we should be celebrating somewhere right yeah. now. It is our month. Um, <laughs> yeah, but the Hate Crimes Act, I mean, it was very popular among lawmakers, but there were several groups that really opposed it. I think there were about 100 different LGBTQ and AAPI groups um, that signed a joint resolution saying that it focused too much on carceral solutions um, and ignored the reality of police violence towards black and brown communities. So their suggestion was to redistribute funds to housing, social services, services, food banks, um, you know, because they feel that policing and things of that nature ha uh, do very little to prevent the violence within our communities. So it's a step in the right direction. There's money, but figuring out where to distribute that money is still 
being right. talked about. Absolutely. A great project you're also highlighting is Heart of Dinner, which is right here in New York City. Mm -hmm. um, Heart of Dinner, they distribute meals and fresh produce to seniors in the New York City area, hundreds of seniors every single week. Um, and what's cool about them is they take, um, they write handmade notes mm -hmm. in the seniors' native language. And if you consider kind of the language services and those barriers that most Asian American seniors uh, confront, that's actually a really significant gesture. It might seem small, but that's really powerful um, with so many of these, you know, the lack of culturally competent services that they often deal with. Yeah, I've seen some of those handwritten notes and the volunteers that have stepped up for Heart mm -hmm. of Dinner on their Instagram. And also culturally appropriate food for the seniors too is really important. Right. Talk to us about Sesame Street. They made history with a new Muppet. Yeah, this the first Asian American Muppet, which like who isn't excited about that? <laughs> also, you know, she's cool. I want to be her. She's like a <laughs> punk rocker. She plays the guitar. She skateboards. And I think what's most interesting about this is she is not a nebulous Asian character that borrows just, you know, From everybody. Right. She is specifically a Korean American. Yeah. She talks about her background. She talks about her relationship with her grandmother. Um, she loves Tukbuki, like things of that nature. <laughs> are really important when we're talking about responsible representation and what can really move the community forward. And her name is G Young. I, I love it too and I, I wish she was a character on Sesame Street when I was growing up because I was I addicted to that show. Same. Thank you Kimmy Young for bringing all that great news to us. We so appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. All right. To have a look at that full list you can go to NBCNews.com slash Asian America. We want to close with our deepest thanks to all of our panelists for speaking so openly and candidly about the ways anti-Asian hate has affected them and what they're doing in the face of discrimination. There are many signs of progress, of allies coming together, and people speaking up and breaking barriers. We know Americans are stronger when we remember our shared connections, so let's keep the conversation going. Thank you for watching The Racism Virus. For all of us at NBC News, I'm Vicki Wynn. Hello, friends, and today, all day nation. Friday has arrived. <laughs> it my has. Friend. We want to welcome you guys uh, back to Today in 30 with a quick trip of everything you may have missed on our show this morning. We're going to start things off with some new developments on the baby formula shortage. It's really gripping families nationwide. Now, the White House is trying to figure out how to address that crisis. We'll have everything you need to know. All right, then, history high atop Mount Everest. We got to chat with an Illinois teenager who just yesterday became the youngest American woman ever to reach the summit. Plus, we are so excited for this. We're gonna take a look back at some of the most popular stories that had our viewers buzzing online this month. Oh, that's always a good one. And Hoda and Jenna brought us a chat with Sean P. Diddy Combs. Is that, is it? Puffy, Sean P. Diddy? It's unclear, it's unclear. Okay, well, he's the host of this weekend's mm -hmm. Billboard Music Awards, and we know him by any name, so I'll be excited to hear what he has to say. It's actually things you've never known about him. Oh. They really come out. Jason Kennedy sat down with him, they're good friends too. But it is time for Today, Today in 30. 30. NBC's Blaine Alexander in Atlanta with the latest. Blaine, good morning. Well, Savannah, good morning to you. You're right. For so many parents, this is truly the topic of conversation. The average three-month-old can go through a can this size in less than a week. So that's why there's growing pressure on the Biden administration to find a solution. This morning, for millions of parents, the frantic search for formula is getting closer to home. It's scary. It's scary not knowing if you're going to be able to feed your kid. And the shortage is growing. 43% of the nation's baby formula supply is out of stock. There was one day that I went to 11 different stores and could not find any. Overnight, the White House announced new steps to address the crisis as President Biden met with retailers and manufacturers, including Walmart, Target, Rickett, and Gerber. Our message to parents is we hear you. We want to do everything we can. The administration is facing growing pressure. This is not a third world country. This should never happen in the United States of America. The new measures include increasing imports of formula, cutting red tape, and asking regulators and states to crack down on price gouging. But the White House acknowledged there is no timeline for when parents can expect to see the results on the shelves. We would certainly uh, encourage any parent who has concerns about their child's health or well-being to call their doctor or pediatrician. For many families, the need is dire. According to the CDC, only 25% of infants consume only breast milk through their first six months, and many rely on specific formula brands. I've 
seen moms in the store crying in the formula aisle because they can't find their baby's formula. Inventories are now so low that some major stores have put limits on how much baby formula you can buy at a time. The month's long shortage comes from a voluntary recall by manufacturer Abbott Nutrition that prompted the shutdown of a major plant, all of it made worse by supply chain issues. Now, parents are scrambling for solutions. Online, searches for homemade formula have spiked, but experts warn against making your own or diluting formula as both could be harmful for your baby. We try to tell parents to remain calm and make sure that they contact us. Well, Blaine, you mentioned the president's new measures. Some lawmakers, including some Democrats, saying it needs to go farther. That's right, Savannah. Some are calling on him to invoke the Defense Production Act. It's a war era measure that gives the president emergency powers to order some companies to produce certain goods. Now, it's something that the White House says that they are exploring, but already at least one company says they're already running their plants 24 7 around the clock, and they say that's only part of the solution. Savannah. All right, Blaine Alexander leading us off. Thank you, Blaine. Meantime, for days, we have just been captivated by that story of the passenger, the guy with no flight experience, who safely landed a small plane after the pilot passed out. It was a truly mm -hmm. remarkable feat, and that had us wondering, wouldn't it be interesting to show how difficult it would be for mm -hmm. someone who is not a pilot to stick the landing? And that's where our guinea pig, NBC's <laughs> Carrie Sanders, came in. Hi, <laughs> Carrie. Don't try this at home, right? Hi, guys. I have even more respect for the passenger term pilot, Darren Harrison. Uh, no, I didn't fly in a plane like this. Instead, I got into a simulator, and that's about as close as anyone would get to the real world pressure that Darren faced. It can take months to years to learn to fly a small plane. So when Darren Harrison, a passenger turned pilot, safely landed a Cessna 208 when the pilot became unconscious mid-flight. I've got a serious situation here about pilot uh, It was nothing short of a miracle. Did you say the passengers landed the airplane? That's correct. Oh my gosh, yeah, yeah. Hell, great job. Even professional pilots applauding. Air traffic controller and weekend flight instructor Bobby Morgan safely guided Harrison behind the controls. What were you thinking as you knew that the hardest part of this now was going to be bringing them in for a landing? Mostly just staying calm. I found out that's not so easy. I'm in a simulator and we're going to give it a shot. So the plane is in a steep dive. I'm going to try to pull it up nice and level. I'm not a pilot. I've never done this before. And now I'm going to call for help. Mayday, Mayday, I need help. All right, no problem, just keep calm. I'm here to help you. Camilla so Ruiz is a certified it. flight instructor. What do I do? Keep turning to the right. My approach into Palm Beach International Airport was a struggle. Nothing's happening. I'm going into trees. I just, I don't know. I landed. But then I crashed. It's a good thing that I'm in a simulator because if this had been a real plane, there are no do-overs. What do you make of what I just did? I was pretty good. Pretty good? Speed. I know, this is hard. What do you think of the passenger who became the pilot and stuck the landing? Amazing. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. nice. You got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? You know what? Our hearts are ready for something like this. Yeah. It's a great workout. It's yeah. everything Actually, you need. What comes back together? Oh, I'm so, so happy. happy. That's what it takes to set a record. So glad to see you. News is happening now. Are you ready? Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now.
Can this still end diplomatically with Vladimir Putin in charge of Russia? Our promise to take in 100,000 Ukrainian refugees. Is that enough? The circus-like stuff that the hearings turned into. This system seems broken. What do we do? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. NBC News, streaming free now. Welcome back this morning on In-Depth Today. History high atop Mount Everest. <laughs> yeah, an adventurous 18-year-old from Illinois just climbed into the record books as the youngest American woman to ever reach that summit. Her name, Lucy Westlake. And by the way, she did it just 10 days before she'll walk in her high school graduation. <laughs> Lucy's with us live from Nepal. But before we talk to her, let's just take a closer look at her historic trek. Lucy Westlake is standing at the top of the world. After reaching Mount Everest's peak yesterday morning, the 18-year-old is now the youngest American woman to summit Everest's highest point, more than 29,000 feet. That's about as high as 18 Empire State Buildings. The Illinois teen completing her Everest expedition in just 24 days. I used to actually be afraid of heights, which is very ironic. Lucy started her mountaineering adventures with her dad when she was just seven years old. I'm at the top of New Mexico on Wheeler Peak. And she's no stranger to breaking records. Last year, she became the youngest woman to reach the highest points in all 50 states. You did it! World record. From Mount Kilimanjaro to Aconcagua, Lucy has reached great heights all over the globe. We can see the top. Boop. Right there. But Lucy says this is just the start. She wants to complete the Explorer's Grand Slam, a climbing challenge to ascend up the highest mountain on each continent and go to the North and South Poles. Now, after Everest, she only has four to go. For me, it's not about breaking records. It's about pushing limits. But first, Lucy will take on a brand new challenge of a different kind, starting her freshman year at USC and distance running for the Trojans on the track and field team. Wowza, <laughs> fresh off her record-breaking <laughs> climb, Lucy's joining us from her hotel in oh. Nepal. Lucy, we just have to say, wow, we are marveling at your life. You're just 18 years old. But will you take us into that moment where you stood atop Mount Everest? It's a feat you usually do with your father. This time you did it solo. Just, just take us inside that moment. Yeah, oh my gosh, it was absolutely incredible being at the top. I I just couldn't imagine that I was at the top of the world. Like I looked down and there was no other, there was no, nothing higher, but still. And it was actually, I thought I was going to cry at the top. I really did. But I actually cried like an hour before the top, mm. which was so strange. It was like when the sun was rising and I thought we had like three more hours to go. And I asked my Sherpa, I was like, how long to the top? And he was like, one more hour. And I was like, I was like, I just knew I was going to make it right then. So oh. like, I started crying. <laughs> it's, it's such an incredible feat. I mean, getting to the top and getting down mm -hmm. and you did all of that. What motivates you, Lucy? Mm -hmm. You know, the old joke is like, why do you climb mountains? And they say, because it's there, mm -hmm. you know, but what, but you have something deeper motivating you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've always been adventurous and I've always loved the mountains, but as I, as the mountains grew and it got harder, I really had to find that like deeper motivation to still, to still want to do them. And it's really just like pushing my limits. I just want to see how far my body and mind can go. And, and I hope to inspire others to do the same because it's really like, that's how you figure out who you are. That's how you, how you discover yourself and discover more about the world is, is just seeing how far that, that your body and mind can go. And so far, I mean, I made it to the top of Everest, so I think I'm doing pretty well so far. But, yeah, you're doing, uh, really, you're doing really, really well. I think what's great about you <laughs> is a lot of people do these kinds of adventures for themselves. Like, I did it, I made it to the top. I feel like your mission is much bigger than just about Lucy. Yeah, for sure. I I actually really have a passion for the world water crisis. And so I hope to raise money and awareness through my climbing for that. Um, that's like one of my big motivations. But also on Everest, this specific ex expedition was to was to help bring more women into the outdoors because I'm it's just I was actually surprised that there were a good amount of women on Everest and it made me smile like walking by them. But but there's still it's such like 
such a sport that's dominated by men. So, and it really like younger people, I also want to get in the mountains because I know they'll love it. I know it should be a place for everybody, everybody who wants to be there, so. Now, look, Lucy, a lot of your expeditions you've done with your father, this one you were alone, mm -hmm. obviously with the, with Sherpas and, and there's a team, it takes a, a village literally to get up the side of Mount Everest, but what do your parents think? It's not like you can text from the top of Mount Everest and be like, I'm cool. <laughs> were, were they nervous about this one? Yeah, definitely. I, they have a lot of trust in me. They do. And our trust has grown over time. My mom, I honestly think she was more nervous about like the smaller mountains when I was like seven or eight than she is now, just cause like that trust has really grown. But uh, one of the hardest parts, maybe the hardest part for me was, was not having my dad there, just being like completely alone. And I, I love my Sherpa. Like he was, he was amazing. He was like my stand in dad, but it's, it's not the same. It was really tough being away from, from everyone, like anyone I knew for 26 days. I was on the mountain for 26 days. Wow. Kill him, but, well, <laughs> yeah. you're heading to high school graduation, which is exciting. It's going to be a big time for you in June. And then you're off to USC and you're going to you're going to run on their cross country uh, track team. So uh, just just tell me a little bit about what's ahead for you. Yeah, I my next like big big mission is to just go to USC and see what I can do running because that's like an equal passion to mountaineering. I love running so much and I I missed it on the mountain. I tried to run like the first few days. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> I had like one of my friends run with me, but yeah, that didn't last long. That didn't last long. So, so I'm really excited to back train summer, get ready. And then in the fall hit USC cross country team hard. And then after that, I'm hoping it to be able, like I, to do the Explorers Grand Slam. That is also one of my big goals. So I have um, a trip to Antarctica left to do Mount Vincent and the South Pole, the North Pole after that, or in any order, the North Pole and then Carson's Pyramid. So I'm also really hoping to do this. Well, wow. Lucy, you blow us away. Yeah. <laughs> you truly do. And we'll be calling your mother later to find out yes. how she did it, because you are an incredible young lady, but I think she'd say it comes straight from you. Yeah. Best of luck to you. Congratulations, Lucy. Oh, Thank wow. You're welcome. What a sweet kid. Uh, oh, my God. I'm totally blown away by her. Wow. Long distance runner. <laughs> yeah, has yeah. a 4.6 GPA. Yeah. Graduated early from, from high school, actually. She's just going to go yeah. walk with her graduating class. Going to USC. Super nice. Let's and go like, home and humble. ground our kids. Yeah. <laughs> or homeschool them or do whatever Lucy's mom did. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Let's go. This is a critical choke point for this fire. And good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world. Because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. You've got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? Sounds so good. I love it. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world. Because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia. Could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition.
this morning. We are launching a brand new segment. We're going to make a hit. It's called This Is Today, which highlights some of the most popular <laughs> stories on today.com. Just to give you some perspective, our website reaches more than 50 million readers every month. And we have Today Digital's editorial director, Ariana Davis, here to tell us what those people are clicking. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for having this me. This is so good. Okay, yeah. so your first story, it's a, a drink. It's called a Dirty Soda. Everybody's buzzing about it. How did yeah. it come to be? Yeah, so Dirty Soda has origins in Utah, and there's a popular soda shop called Swig. Okay. And essentially, it's just soda with a little bit of creamer, an optional flavored like fruit syrup. But our food editor, Emmy, spotted this trend that's all over TikTok. Everyone wow. is recreating their own version of this. Um, and Olivia Rodrigo posted I'm her so with it. Oh, and that's what really it just blew it up. Oh, thank you. Have viral. you tried it? I have not tried this yet. Wait, oh. what? Full on cream or half and half? I haven't Full had on, soda like, in a that, decade. Apparently, anything that, so we talked to the founder of Swig. Thank you, Mr. Roker. Anything Al just that doesn't want to drink it. <laughs> oh, there's one more here. I'll make you the guinea pig. Yeah, um, anytime it. you add anything to a soda, apparently that makes it dirty. That's what the founder of Swig, Nicole Tanner, told us. Um, I am curious to see how this is going to actually taste. Listen, that's good. I mean, it well, just tastes like it's, it's kind, kind of like, like a, 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 a Coke float. Yeah, yeah. it's like oh, like it's like, like the ice cream melted. Yeah. That's good. It's a cream soda. I was right. skeptical. I'm going to admit. Yeah. Oh, this, this is good. I actually see what all the hype is about. Yeah, this is like I'll sugar in a glass. So That's yeah. very oh, good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's really good. Yeah, it's actually pretty it's good. Sweet. Yeah, thank apparently, you. according to the Mind founder, it. if you add anything, cream, okay. any type of flavored so syrup, anything that you add, it makes your soda dirty. Ooh. She liked the name. Just and the flowers are cool. still stained. Yeah. Dirty soda. Okay. okay, so let's talk about Mindy Kaling. This is her approach to weight loss, and people are really buzzing about it, and it's kind of a healthy approach, I think. Okay. Yeah. Ever since the pandemic, stories about walking and, and walking routines have been doing really yeah, well for us online. Like 50,000 steps a day. Yeah, our readers have a lot in common with, with Al, and Mindy actually recently opened up to us. I'll let her explain her latest, her latest oh, routine. Okay. Mindy. Working out can, can be like a really like private, moment where people aren't you know they don't need anything from you and and that can be great but i've also discovered that like you know working out and deciding that a walk is a good form of working out mm. yeah, yeah. So walking she, is having a moment i what? feel like you were a trendsetter well, well, the great thing Always. about it is you don't need anything special you don't need any special equipment you just go and you do it exactly right. yeah. yeah there's also the the taylor swift treadmill strut is the latest tiktok workout routine that we oh. also just Wait, did a well, story about it's like a very tell. specific workout set to taylor swift music if you check it out on tiktok um, okay. but if anyone um, wants to get in on the fun june 1st we're kicking off our second annual walking challenge on today.com so we need, i need oh, cool. to do that. Yeah, yeah. we'll have more about that too yeah. on our show uh, also next story animals always do very well mm. on today.com uh so what what kind of animal is this and and i understand there's a family that picked him up on the side of the road. Yeah, as a dog mom, I love the story. <laughs> a dog there's, mom. there's a family in Massachusetts who was just driving on the highway and they saw a puppy on the side of the road kind of struggling. They picked him up, took him home to take care of him, <gasps> realized it's actually a baby coyote. Oh my wow. God, not yes. a puppy. Yeah, not a, a puppy, baby coyote. So they took the little guy to an animal shelter and luckily the story had a happy ending. There was no rabies exposure, but wow. they recommend that if you do ever happen to stumble upon a wild animal on the side of the road, Maybe just call the shelter first. Yeah. Like, Mommy, can yeah. we keep it? Yeah. <laughs> right, really quickly. It's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Exactly. <laughs> this puppy's mean. Uh, Monotasking. He's biting me. He <laughs> won't let go. It's the new multitasking. It's called monotasking. Amen. Right? I yes. totally multitasking is agree dead. with it, apparently. Yes. I feel like most of us in the pandemic, we were like making lunch for our kids while we're Zooming and slacking and emailing. Mm. We think that makes us more productive, no. but it actually is leading to burnout. It's, yes. it's, it's something that experts are recommending that we actually move away from and that we lean in more to monotasking, which is basically, wait for it, focusing on one thing at a time. Mind blown. Right? Oh. Just one thing. Unbelievable. Don't text you while you're watching of. your shows. Don't multi, just monotasking right. is it. Ariana, you Be were in the great. Moment. Thank you so much. Thank I like you. Thank segment. you. Me too. Cool for these segment. stories and more, you can head to today.com or you can sign up for our new Business Today newsletter. Just scan that QR code and you'll get the latest in news, pop culture, and oh, so much more in your email inbox every single morning. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. You got a whole restart. How does that land with you? 
Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? Sounds so good. I love it. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Can this still end diplomatically with Vladimir Putin in charge of Russia? Our promise to take in 100,000 Ukrainian refugees. Is that enough? The circus-like stuff that the hearings turned into. This system seems broken. What do we do? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. The Billboard Music Awards are this weekend on NBC. I mean, I care about the Billboard Music Awards, but I care a lot more about our friend Jason Kennedy. He sat down with this year's host, Sean Diddy Combs, out in L.A., but he's actually sitting with someone far more famous to oh. us, Baby, Baby River. River. Oh, Jason. Oh, and look at the puppy licking look the at my baby. Boy. Oh, my God. River has Can nothing to do with Diddy. But he's six weeks old, and this is your live television debut. Don't screw it up, buddy. You're doing so good. I think he's gassy. <laughs> I'm going to give him back to Lola Bean. <laughs> um, but it's been really incredible, and I appreciate all the love you all have really shown us. So thank you. Thank you. We're so happy to watch your life change. So tell us about Mr. Diddy. Yes, please. I gotta be honest, I've interviewed him uh, a lot of times over the years. I think the first time was 15 years ago, but something felt different this time around. He really seemed at peace, which is a great thing because as you all know, he's been through a lot the past few years. Take a look. I know it's a good day when I get to sit down and talk with you. Even the energy when you walk in here, man, you are in the zone. Nobody can tell you that Diddy is not ready for this. Yeah, I mean, I was kind of born to do this. I'm in a real high frequency right now, and so it's, it's like a Diddy party. This Diddy party like no other. The 2022 Billboard Music Awards. The show, a moment of personal redemption for the music mogul. The first two times I hosted the award show, I really sucked. What? What do you mean? You, what happened? Like, because I used to like live in my head sometimes when I start on Broadway or I'm hosting the MTV Awards. I was nervous on those two. But you know, now I come back in glorious fashion. Different mindset, I won't stop. And so now I'm coming to knock this thing out the park. The lineup has all the makings of an epic event. Performances by Ed Sheeran, Meg The Stallion, and maybe the man himself? As someone who's interviewed you for years, this just yeah. makes me happy. Yeah. And you promised those surprises. Yeah. And I, I've left my six-week-old son at home mm -hmm. to get at least something from you. Okay. And I can't hear that. You know, you're going to have to wait and watch. Can you give me anything? Because a little birdie did tell me you might perform. The whole night I will be performing. <laughs> I can give you that. I can, that's breaking news. The whole night, Diddy will be performing. He'll be doing all of his hits in his grand splendor. Whatever I got to do. It's going to be turned up. It's going to be lit. But through all the hype, it's not lost on Diddy that this is truly a defining moment in his life, way bigger than music. We were talking a little privately, and hopefully you can share if you feel yeah. comfortable. You said this is an important moment for you personally. Yeah, because I, I, I mean, I lost a lot of people that I love. You know, I stopped being creative, and I also just stopped being happy. It really put me down to like, like one of the lowest places. In 2018, he suddenly lost Kim Porter, the mother of his three children. Their twin daughters were just 11 at the time. Bro. When I lost Kim, it was like something like, <clears throat> like in my, my whole body and my whole thing. And it was just like, first of all, I wasn't really complete in my destiny. You know what I'm saying? And it just shook me up, you know? And it, and it had me to really like kind of go on that journey. Like, yo, you got some things you have to deal with. It's so quick to kind of get into your mind and to give up and to go down, and um, I didn't give up, you know? I didn't give up, and I just want to be that shining example 
to people and I want to lift people up. Among those Diddy is lifting up, the next generation of students. A handful of years ago on the East Coast, you helped start a school. Yes. Beautiful mission. And now the inaugural class is getting ready to graduate. And I can't imagine what those words sound like in your head. They're about to graduate and you had a massive portion in their life. That's really dope, but that's beautiful. I don't know if I looked at it like that, you know what I'm saying, how deep it really is, is that, you know, me coming from Harlem and being able to affect my community in a positive way, to know that 100% of our kids go to college. I'm proud of them, I'm so proud of them. He's also sharing a message of love through his new music. It is out there that you're working on your seven studio album. Yes, yes. So I'm curious about the vibe of it. I did an all R&B album. I'm a love maker. I'm a Scorpio. I love making love. And I don't have no music to make love to. So you're <coughs> going to put your own album on while you make love? Is yeah. that what you're telling me? I, I, I do it all the time. That's why I know it works. I haven't given up on love. I, as I said, I lost the mother of my children, but I haven't given up. At 52, after a challenging season, a renewed Diddy is spreading love and back on stage, right where the world wants to see him. I'm on my second mountain. I got a second chance at life. I had to really go through the healing journey and dig up out of it. And so now when I dig up out of it, I'm like, man, I'm still doing whatever I want to do. I take every day as a blessing. His second mountain for sure. I didn't really expect him to talk about Kim Porter, but he went there, I could tell it was on his heart and mind and he wanted to discuss that on camera. But clearly, as you can tell, it's a new season for him. He's ready for this weekend. Diddy's back, baby. Oh my gosh, Jason, that was a great Jason, interview. Jason, only you. That was a beautiful interview. Awesome. By the way, Billboard uh, Music Awards are this Sunday night on NBC, 8, uh, 5 p.m. Pacific, and they'll stream live on Peacock. Okay, guys, don't forget. And how could you? Harry Styles is going to take over our plaza in just six days. What are you going to wear? I, I actually <laughs> am thinking about my outfit. I want to be inspired by Harry Styles. Okay. Oh, I like that already. Yeah. All right, okay. pants in. We'll see you next week. Have a great weekend. Bye. What are you going to wear, folks? <laughs>《When you think Texas, you think beef, brisket, and barbecue. But here in Austin, the state's capital, there's so much more than that. We've got folks and chefs from all around the world who are putting their mark on this city's culinary scene. And in fact, the spices and traditions that pay homage to their families are making Austin a hot food scene. It's really kind of this melting pot of different people, their culture, and their food. The creativity and, and the flavor that they put into the food is really artistry, right? It's really the diversity of food. Like, you can get some of everything here. So what keeps Austin weird and tasty? We're about to find out. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. Austin is home to over 1,200 food trucks in food parks just like this one. But we're here for one specific truck. We're here for Tony's Jamaican, serving up fine Caribbean fare to Austin for more than 10 years. Meet food truck owner Tony Scott and his wife Kim. From humble beginnings in Kingston, Jamaica, Tony has made Austin his home since 2003, and he has always had a passion for flavorful food. When did you start cooking? How young were you? 10. Tony's mother, Hyacinth, taught her sons how to be self-sufficient, especially in the kitchen. So you learned from mom early on? Yes. What was it about cooking that you liked? I don't know, I like food, I don't know. <laughs> Those skills learned during childhood would help Tony define his career. For nearly a decade, he worked a small beachside business, serving jerk chicken and drinks to tourists in Jamaica. But after 9-11, tourism to the island stalled. So Tony moved to the U.S. in search of better opportunities, eventually landing in Austin. 
With construction booming in the state capital, Tony quickly found a job as a painter. But it was his homemade lunches that reignited an idea. You're working, you're, you bring in Jamaican food that you made, and some of your friends taste and say, where'd this I, come from? I, yes, I cook my own food. You know, and they was like, oh, you should, you know, open a restaurant. And it's been 10 years. 10 years now. The 60-year-old chef opened Tony's Jamaican food truck in March of 2012. And his wife, Kim, has been one of his biggest supporters since the very beginning. What was the first meal he cooked for? Curry chicken and rice. And he invited me over, and once I had it, I didn't want to ask for more. You know how ladies are, we try to eat a little bit, maybe the salad kind of thing. Don't want them to know that we that greedy. But it was so good, I asked for seconds. So when Tony says, I want to do a food truck, your reaction? I said, a what? <laughs> I said, a food what? And I knew nothing about food trucks or however, so it was just all his idea. I just followed along. He said he wanted to do something, he had a vision. I said, okay, let's try it. Despite high praise from friends and family for his grub, Tony's business wasn't exactly booming from the start. When you first opened up, was it successful right away? <laughs> no. <laughs> I came out here 10 o'clock in the morning and I was all here until 3 o'clock the next oh. morning. I make $37. Wow. And you know, I was still happy when I go home and she was like, how much money you make? And I was like, $37. And she break out laughing. <laughs> and I was like, don't worry about it. And next day I come and I make $50 something mm -hmm. and the next day I make $80 something and I said, okay, I'm seeing an increase. Tony taking advantage of the South by Southwest crowds that flocked to Austin in early March. Shortly after the festival, his fledgling business got a big boost with a small write-up. Kim, what, what to you, what was the game changer? What, what put this place over the top? Wow. His presence and his dedication. Your chicken and hot sauce. Now, loyal customers are visiting this hot spot daily, decked out with the colors and vibes of Jamaica. From curried chicken and goat to jerk everything, food fans walk away feeling the island love. In 2018, Tony laid down more permanent roots in Texas. You opened up a brick and mortar restaurant. Were you nervous about that? A little bit. It was a little bit. Let me hear. Kim, were you nervous? Oh, about yeah. That? I'm so glad you asked me that question. Yes, I was. It was something totally different and from a food truck going into a brick and mortar. I didn't come from the restaurant industry. I came from the finance side. Coming in, I was like, I was telling Tony, I said, I got this, you know, I can run this, no problem. But oh, no, 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 no. I was ringing the, the red light bell, like, hey, I need some help. It was challenging, but also it was fun. Kim now helping run the business for both locations. Family always mean a lot to restaurant. You know, sometimes she, she would say, you never know. One day it might be just me and you. You gotta show right. me how to cut this meat. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world. Because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Can this still end diplomatically with Vladimir Putin in charge of Russia? Our promise to take in 100,000 Ukrainian refugees. Is that enough? The circus-like stuff that the hearings turned into. This system seems broken. What do we do? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. To cover the news, you have to be in it. These are families trying to board those trains to Poland. I also want to get home. You'll get home. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Can this still end diplomatically with Vladimir Putin in charge of Russia? Our promise to take in 100,000 Ukrainian refugees. Is that enough? The circus-like stuff that the hearings turned into. This system seems broken. What do we do? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Can this still end diplomatically with Vladimir Putin in charge of Russia? Our promise to take in 100,000 Ukrainian refugees. Is that enough? The circus-like stuff that the hearings turned into. This system seems broken. What do we do? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. 
jerk yeah. chicken and oxtail. Thank you Enjoy. very much, sir. Have a great day. You too. God bless. Tony Scott dishes out hundreds of plates to hungry customers each day, but he's best known for one Caribbean specialty. My mother is Jamaican, and in our house, oxtail was king. Yes. Yeah. Oxtail stew, oxtail and dumpling. Yeah. Oxtail, oh, wow. oxtail, oxtail. My mom is Southern, and she actually mentioned it to me. I said, oxtail, and she just said it was a beef. So I've never really had it. And then when you first had it? It was delicious, and I eat it all the time now. That's the problem for now. <laughs> Isn't it interesting that it was the cheapest cut of meat? Now it's considered wow. a delicacy. You go to all these oh. upscale restaurants, oxtail uh, ravioli, oh. oxtail rice, all of them. It's now everybody's into oxtail. I know. No, I'm scared to go in a restaurant and not oxtail. <laughs> right. the, the price is so high. Bring on the oxtail stew! <laughs> Tony frequently sells out of the succulent oxtail, and it was finally time to see and taste why. Welcome to the truck, Mr. Oh, Hall. Oh, yeah. Oh, it smells good. It smells like Jamaica. Oh, hey, hey. This is the oxtail, oh. the famous oxtail that everybody go crazy over. Mm -hmm. And these are like the Jamaican product seasoning that we use. This have a good flavor to mm. it. Oh, wow. Tony's oxtails are seasoned with a spice mix that includes garlic powder, dried onion, paprika, black pepper, sugar, salt, and a few chef secrets. This is my product that I make. It's have like onion, it, it, um, bell pepper, um, scotch bonnet pepper. I also have a little bit of garlic in there. So this is like your own concoction? Yes. And then this is another Jamaican product they call Yava Blue Mountain Coffee. Uh, yeah. Well, they say it's the best coffee in the world. Well, right. this is the Blue Mountain product of burnt sugar. Oh, wow. And this is what we pour on it last, give it that, that good color. Then we just mix this up, make sure you rub it in properly. You want everything to rub into it. Normally, if you take a smell of it, even right now. Oh, yeah. You see, you, you, you can smell that flavor in it and it doesn't even cook. It smells, it. smells good. Right. He then lets the oxtails marinate overnight. Then, they're added to a pot with water and slow cooked for several hours. This what it comes out to be. Oh, now we're talking. For you to taste. When I came to Austin. The result, truly out of this world. You see how it fall off the bone. Mm. Oh, yeah. You know, we, we make sure we cook real tender because dental is very expensive. Mm -hmm. And you know, you go to some place, you have eating that meat and you have to be here to get it off the bone. You don't do that when you come mm -hmm. here. Good thing Tony feels like talking. I'm too busy eating. And it doesn't stop with the oxtails. Oh, is it, Mr. Hall? That's fantastic. This is curry goat right here. Taste that. <laughs> this is the jerk pork. Oh, jerk, but I've never had jerk pork before. Oh. And that's also oh, wow. my homemade jerk sauce that I made. Whoa. Okay, this is the famous curry chicken. And this is the carrot. Oh, so at least I can say I have my vegetables today. Yes. Look at how tender that chicken is. Tony also serves traditional peas and rice, which brought on a wave of nostalgia. This is black bean. When you open that pot, I thought, wait a minute. Yeah. This is my mother's peas and rice. This is bread. And just when I thought I'd had enough? Wait a minute, I, I, I noticed. These are beef patty. I gotta try them. Oh, that's a great crust. As a reminder of how far Tony's love for cooking has taken him. If you look up here, you see these little pots? Uh -huh. This pot right here is when I just started out. This is what I usually cook rice into. Wow. The reason why I keep this pot to show people is where Tony's Jamaican food is coming from. Mm -hmm. So what would you tell people who are thinking they've got a dream, they want to start something like you did? What would you tell them? First, you have to motivate yourself to do it. And never give up on your dream. 
my mama always tell me, don't make nobody tell you you can't do nothing. Tony, thank you so much. It's this a pleasure, Harley. It, it, it is it, nice meeting you. It feels like I'm back in Jamaica. I'm glad you have that feeling. Everything's going to be all right. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. My name is this. Hallie Jackson Now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. My name is this. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. You've got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? You know what? Our hearts are ready for something like this. Yeah. It's a great workout. It's yeah. everything Actually, you need. Who comes back together? Oh, I'm so, so happy. happy. That's what it takes to set a record. So glad to see you. To cover the news, you have to be in it. These are families trying to board those trains to Poland. I also want to get home. You'll get home. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. These are families trying to board those trains to Poland. I also want to get home. You'll get home. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. NBC News, streaming free now. Just a few miles from the hustle and bustle of downtown Austin is Mekon Bistro. It is a spot that's loved by locals and tourists alike for its Vietnamese comfort food. Who's the better cook uh, in the family? Um, I'm not going to even bother asking my mom about that because... My mom is hands down the best cup. <laughs> Chef Will Hyun and his siblings opened Mekon Bistro to honor their mother, Anne Hang, a refugee who fled Vietnam after the fall of Saigon and working tirelessly to provide for her family in the United States. She took a chance to travel across the ocean with nothing in hand working ever since she's been over here, working from morning to night uh, and still provide us with a hot meal every day. When Macon first opened, Will hoped that his mom would finally stop working, but Anne had other plans. Technically, she's retired, but like I said, she, she would not stay home. Anne's passion for food starting in her home country. In 1972, Anne married Kia Huynh. They had four children in Vietnam. Anne turning to cooking to help support the family. Okay. This is my dad and my mom right, right before the fall of Saigon. When the Vietnam War ended, the family was looking toward a better future in their homeland. But in 1975, the Viet Cong began to invade Saigon. Anne's husband fled the city first, Will leaving when he was just seven years old. It was scary. We left separately, uh, me with my uncle and my mom with my three sisters that came a year later uh, because if you get caught, you were thrown in jail. Luckily, we made it out. We were rescued by uh, cargo boats, but uh, they rescued us. They took us to the Malaysian refugee camp. Will and his uncle secured refugee status eventually reuniting with Will's dad in the U.S. In the years spent apart from his mother, Will began experimenting in the kitchen, 
with a little nudge from his uncle. He told me that, you know, there's only two of us. You're going to have to do, you know, do your share. So learn to cook something. <laughs> In 1983, Anne made the journey to the U.S. with her daughters. Đi dược biên thì nó đi tàu nhỏ thì nó cũng hơi khó khăn nhưng mà qua được cái ấy rồi toàn tụ gia đình đó thì rất mừng. Tại vì chồng con gặp lại mặt chồng con hết. Thành ra rất là sung sướng. But adjusting to a new country as refugees was a struggle. When we came over, you know, nothing in our pockets. We, we relied on government assistance a little bit. Luckily, she's a great cook. <laughs> so it, it wasn't bad for us at all. But growing up, that's how she you know, shows us that she loved us by you know, putting all that love into the food. The family moving from Houston to Louisiana, finding work in the seafood industry. But Will wasn't so happy living in a small town. When his uncle invited him to attend high school in Austin, Will said yes right away. I fell in love with Austin. The beautiful lakes, the miles of trails, the music scene. What's there not to love? <laughs> Austin's vibrant culinary scene struck a chord. After high school, Will found work in several restaurants, dreaming of being able to showcase his mom's cooking. In 2015, the entire family moving to Austin. But Ann still wasn't sure about opening a restaurant. Asked her many, many times in the past to do something like that. She gets set against it. She said, it's just way too much work. Eventually, Ann agreed to share her recipes for just one reason, her family. Thích làm với con cái mới mới lên hái hát với con cho con. Chứ giờ lớn tuổi rồi thì cũng còn sống được bao lâu nữa. Thì lại giờ cho cho con được ngày nào thì hay ngày nấy thì hát cho con mình ngày nào thì hay ngày nấy thôi. She's, she's emotional because like, you know, she basically you know, she's doing everything for her kids. The first dish Will added to the menu, his mom's pho. So pho, you know, at a restaurant is basically how we do pho at home. Uh, when we cook pho at home, it's a big pot that's going to feed us for at least three days. Um, we have it pho for breakfast, we have pho for lunch, we have pho for midtime snack, we have pho for dinner and follow at night for snack at night uh, until the pot's gone. With the help of his family, Will created several new dishes. Our menu does incorporate a lot of uh, fusion Asian dishes. Um, and that is because of the, you know, the family business. Uh, my, my mom's a cook, I cook, my sister cooks, my brother cooks. Uh, second beef dish was something that I've tried out. I consider myself a Texan. We love beef. It's a dish that my mom and I collaborated together to, to put out. Basically, just tubes of real nice tender beef that's been flashed in a wok. It's been six years since Macon Bistro opened, and Will and his mom still love working together. Làm ăn gia đình thì cái này cũng như giúp cho con thôi. Thầy thấy nó nó tự xúc động rồi mình nấy thì thôi chứ mà đâu có biết làm sao giờ. Mình thấy nó hy sinh cho con mình được ngày nào thì hãy nấy vậy thôi. Mình thấy nó xúc động vậy thôi. I admire her great. The courage it takes just to make that journey and to just stick with us no matter thick and thin. She's my hero. She really is my hero. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. These are families trying to board those trains to Poland. I also want to get home. You'll get home. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world. Because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Can this still end diplomatically with Vladimir Putin in charge of Russia? Our promise to take in 100,000 Ukrainian refugees. Is that enough? The circus-like stuff that the hearings turned into. This system seems broken. What do we do? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. 
NBC News, streaming free now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Using food to bring younger generations closer to their heritage happens in families all across America. And it's happening here at Habesha with a husband and wife team who's using their restaurant to bring their daughters closer to their Ethiopian roots. We want more than anything else people to be familiar with not just Ethiopian food, but Ethiopian culture. My name is Yine Fantu. This is my wife, Salama Bebe. We ran an Ethiopian restaurant called Habesha in Austin. When it opened in 2013, Habesha was the second Ethiopian restaurant in Austin. People stay coming in here. We give them the food. They said, where's the fork? Your hands. <laughs> Ethiopian food is eaten with injera, a fermented flatbread made with teff, a gluten-free grain. You'll see a family dining and everyone is on their phone eating and really not enjoying the, the, the event. Not you cannot here. do that in Ethiopian restaurants. You have to use your hands, it's you can't. Both of them. That emphasis on family is everywhere in Habesha, from the Ethiopian art and decor to Yidni and Salam's daughters, who can often be found studying at the restaurant. I think I was like around four years old when we opened, so like this is like my second home. Salam and Yidni were born and raised in different parts of Ethiopia. In the 90s, they left Africa to attend college here in the United States. Yidni immigrating to Texas, Salam to Maryland, where her family owned an Ethiopian restaurant. A chance meeting bringing them together. My dad was visiting a friend, dining at uh, her family restaurant, and she happened to be the waitress. And uh, he overheard a music playing and uh, asked her, hey, uh, where could I get the CD? And she was nice enough to, to grab the CD and hand it to him. But Yidney's dad was thinking about more than music. When he got home, he immediately gave his son a call. And he said, hey, just uh, call her and thank her for me. <laughs> <laughs> when he called me, I was like, I give it to your dad, not for you. <laughs> and then he kept calling me. I was like, OK, I think he's not going to give up. My dad was uh, one who hooked me up. To this. <laughs> <laughs> they dated long distance before Salam moved to Texas, the couple marrying in 2003. Their daughters, Edel and Azel, are now teenagers. I think we've always been around food. My mom's always cooking for me. I love her pancakes. She makes the best pancakes. Salam left the restaurant industry to focus on parenting, but Yidney knew his wife's heart was in cooking professionally. What I saw in her was the passion to own her own business. I really want to open a restaurant, and I love the customer service and cooking. In 2012, Yidney and Salam finding the perfect location for their restaurant. Austin is a, a, a very unique town in that there is people from all walks of life. And I think part of the reason that we are successful is because of that diversity. Habesh's menu honors their Ethiopian heritage with many vegetarian dishes, from stewed yellow split peas to braised collard greens. They also serve more than a dozen dishes with beef. Texas is, uh, has a lot of people that loves meat, so we have a bigger selection of meat as well. And I think my favorite dish in that is the kutfo, or the steak tartare. When it's uh, done right, that's probably the best dish in the world. It's a ground beef and mixed with butter and spices. When the pandemic hit, Habish's popularity helped save them from closure. And I said, okay, this is it. I, I think we're going to fall down now. And then people, they support us. They love to be here. They send us check. They send us cards. We have a good, good community. The donations from fans kept them afloat until they figured out a to-go plan. Before COVID, takeout business was only 3 or 4% of our business. And overnight, we had to do 100% of our business 
and by nature Ethiopian food is not takeout so we have to figure out a way to package the food to market the food. After laying off most employees, the couple had to work nonstop. As the to-go business began ramping up, Edel and Azel pitched in to support their parents and save their beloved second home. I would write down like the orders, like the online orders, and I would like put them in the kitchen and cleaning, washing the dishes, cutting the injera, like folding it, boxing up to the orders. They did a lot and they were part of the reason why we're still around, so I'm sorry I get a little emotional when I talk about them, but uh, yeah, they're, uh, they're incredible. They're uh, just a uh, love of my life. One of the things that we instill in them is knowing who they are, uh, where their parents came from, and learning the culture, learning the food. Salam is looking forward to a busier future at her dream restaurant. I want to uh, grow this business and a lot of people, they never had Ethiopian food. They had Chinese food, Italian food, or Indian food. So they don't know about Ethiopian food. I'm really proud of her because like she, she gets frustrated at times, but she doesn't let that like stop her. A really big inspiration to me. Whenever things get hard, you just keep going. The best part working with your partner is the fact that you're there for each other, to comfort each other when it's down and uh, to be there when your partner needs you. The best part of it, he knows what I can't do, he covered. The same thing, he cannot cook. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, she can handle it. With Austin's welcoming atmosphere, it's no surprise that more chefs are putting down roots in this fast-growing city. It's everything from James Beard award-winning chefs and taqueros and even home cooks. The thing that makes a food scene good is different cultures meeting each other and being able to influence each other. The fact that anything is possible is what makes Austin such a cool place. One thing that rings true here in Austin no matter your background or culture, there's room for everyone at the table. Good morning. Feeding frenzy, the nationwide baby formula shortage going from bad to worse. I went to 11 different stores and could not find any. The White House this morning scrambling to take action as desperate families face empty shelves. Inside, the new plan to replenish supplies and how soon it might help. New threats. Russia now warning of dire consequences.